All right, thank you. Uh, all right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, sixth uh, Collider Cup from the uh, hosted by the Satarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. Um, this, this is um, this is a great event. This is our showcase event, actually, for you know the best team, or the top nominated teams from every one of our classes, and that's really um, out of quite a pool. Uh, we have somewhere around it varies around 2,000 students every year, uh, 15 to 20 classes easily in um, running at any one time. So uh, best teams nominated from all the classes will be uh, showcased or highlighted here today. Um, uh, Satarja Center is, of course, uh, the place to uh, study uh, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Um, for the students, congratulations for being nominated and being among the best of the teams uh, over the semester. And to all the visitors and to um, judges and to our entrepreneurial lecturers and uh, you know all of you that are here today, I just want to say thank you for um, being part of our network and community because it really is the heart of what this center is. And with that, I'm going to turn it back and we'll uh, get started um, with the presentations. All right, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Iklok, uh, for welcoming. And yes, this is um, exciting. Um, welcome everybody to um, to our event today. And I uh, would like to have a moment here to um, welcome our uh, sponsor. Welcome, we're excited to be here and uh, be the sponsor for the event. The Intuitive Foundation focuses on really the intersection of business and technology and sponsoring entrepreneurship. So we're very glad to be here. And then Jindeli Bilo, uh, who used to be at Berkeley, has joined us to help run this event as well. And she's one of our guests today. So thank you very much for joining us. Great, thank you. And um, I also would just like to share really quick um, um, our sponsor um, here that uh, for the Intuitive Foundation. Um, you can follow them on Facebook, also on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, so thank you for that. And um, yeah, thank you to the Intuitive Foundation for being a part of this. We really appreciate it. All right, so now we're going to introduce our judges. And judges, I'm going to stop sharing here. And if each one of you could, um, I'll call on you and you can sort of turn on your screen and say a little something, um, that would be great. So I'll stop share here. All right, so let's start with Jay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Onda with Orange Silicon Valley. Uh, we're the innovation outpost of Orange Telecom, uh, spanning in 29 countries over Africa and the NEA region. Um, our role is to work with the Silicon Valley ecosystem to look at strategic opportunity. Um, and I've been part of this program uh, with the Berkeley SC team for the last three years, I think, as a judge. So, you know, every semester I've seen just a, a level up of the presentations and the quality of the student student pitches. So, look forward to what we see today, and uh, good luck, everybody. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Tamana. I just joined Y Combinator as their outreach manager, and YC basically is an accelerator that funds early stage startups. So, super excited to be here and see what you all have. Thank you so much, Tamana. All right, Marvin Lau, if you could please turn on your screen and tell say a few words. Thank you. All right. Hi, hi everyone, and I'm also very, very honored to be invited to be here to judge. Uh, my name is Marvin. I've been in Silicon Valley now for the last 21 years. I uh, was in startups for a couple of years, was executive at Yahoo for about a decade, um, have done a bit of angel investing, was most recently a partner of 500 startups running the core accelerator program. And um, this year, just mentoring a lot of startup accelerators and speaking at conferences and just goofing around. Um, and thanks for having me. All right, thank you, Marvin. We're so happy to have you here too. And last but certainly not least, back over to Gabe. Hopefully you guys can hear me. My screen still says that I am. Um... Uh, not available, but I'll assume I'm available to speak and I'm getting a note that's saying I'm good, so thank you. Um, so I uh, actually didn't have two hats today, I only packed one, so I had my Intuitive Foundation hat as a sponsor and my judge, but we've worked with a lot of universities. I've been particularly impressed with Berkeley and the sports tech program that we spent a lot of time with over the last few months, so I'm quite excited today and I think they'll all be great competition today. Looking forward to it and it's, uh, I think that's it for me, so thank you. Great, thank you, Gabe. Alrighty, so now I'm just going to quickly go back to a share screen as we are going to have Michelle say a few words um, about a certificate of entrepreneurship and a little bit of our fall course preview. 
Michelle. Great, thank you. Um, so as Melissa said, my name is Michelle Lee. I'm the Academic Program Manager um, for SAT. And so that means that I manage our Certificate of Entrepreneurship and Technology and our courses as well. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the certificate and do a, a little preview of our fall courses. So this slide shows a little bit about our Certificate in Entrepreneurship and Technology. It is open to all majors, so you do not have to be an engineering student. Um, there is no application to get into the certificate program. You apply to earn the certificate when you're completing the requirements. So in the last term that you're completing the courses or the internship or you know, the last requirement or whatever track you're completing. You can overlap your courses with your major or minor and the certificate, so that's a nice benefit. And there are three possible tracks to complete the certificate. So you can see there's the coursework track, which is the most typical, I would say, where students will take our Newton Lecture Series, which is a one-unit course, plus five additional units from our approved course list. The startup track is the Newton Series plus four units, and then participation in one of our programs that you can see on our website. And typically that would be participation in an internship at a startup. The third track is the study abroad track, where you would participate in our entrepreneurship and innovation in Europe program. This just shows a little bit about our fall courses that we're planning to offer. So you can see the list here and you can see a lot of details about those on our courses page. So the URL is just at the top of the screen here. Um, I do want to point out that all majors are welcome for all of our classes. We do have a number of reserved seats in each of our courses though, so be mindful of that as well. Um, and you can see lots of details on the academic guide about um, things like if a course requires permission of the instructor, which is not typical, but some of them do. Um, a couple of them have an application as well, so be mindful of that. Um, I believe one has prerequisites, so again, you can take a look at that at the academic guide to see all of those details. And if you have any questions about enrollment or our certificate, um, take a look at our website. There's lots of information there, but feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Awesome, thank you, Michelle. All right, so thank you again for being here today. I'm just going to run over a little bit of the logistics of kind of how this is going to run. Again, I also really appreciate uh, just sort of bearing with us. This is obviously our first time doing this virtually. It's usually a wonderful live event, usually in one of our larger auditoriums. There's demo tables and food and things, and hopefully by the fall, we'll be able to do this and gather again. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed for that. Obviously also want to just do a quick shout out to our medical front lines and the heroes of our time um, during this very different time in our lives. Um, but um, we're persevering in the spirit of innovation. Here we are. So um, just a quick rundown for kind of for today. Um, each team, we have 11 teams total, are going to be pitching. Um, and there will be a um, four minute pitch from students, uh, followed by about two minutes of judge Q&A and feedback. And yes, this will be time just to try and keep things moving. Um, there will be a live audience poll um, after each pitch, which is going towards our People's Choice Award. So we really encourage you, our audience, to participate and to vote. Um, and so that will, um, I'll be releasing the polls um, after each pitch. It should pop up on your screen, just um, choose your score, and then we'll be tallying that up at the end. So thank you in advance for being a part of this and for participating after and um, really contributing to, to this event. Um, after all of our pitches, all 11, our judges will be convening separately. They're actually going to leave this meeting and go and convene and um, choose the winner. During that time, Ken Singer, our Chief Learning Officer and Managing, Dir Managing Director will announce the winners of our teaching awards, um, a course coordinator and um, instructor, which was voted on by all students and faculty um, through SET. So it's a really big award and we're very honored to be able to give it to those who are receiving it today. Um, and then we'll also be having word from ICLOC about our Innovation That Matters Now initiatives, which includes addressing COVID-19 and how you can be involved. Um, finally, at about noon, uh, the judges will be returning here to the Zoom and will announce the winner of the Six Collider Cup. And then we are going to try to do a screenshot with as many faces we can fit on a screen. And um, hopefully that'll be for the, for the history books. And that will be a wrap. So thank you again. Thanks for bearing with us. And Keith, over to you. Yeah, hello everyone and welcome. Okay, so on to the main event. We have 11 pitches here for you today. Um, and just to put this into a bit of context, uh, this semester we had over 800 students participating in our classes. Uh, so you can um, see that there were um, several venture projects in each class. So these 11 pitches we have for you today represent uh, student teams that uh, worked really hard this semester on their uh, venture projects. Uh, first, we want to also congratulate every student in our class for working hard this semester on their startups. And if we can just kind of think about, you know, the, all the innovation that's going to come out of these courses, it really is very amazing. So on to um, our first pitch. Uh, so our first class um, uh, is Innovation Engineering, and this is 190E, uh, taught by Professor Iklaat Sidhu. Yeah, okay, great. All right, so um, this will be quick, but I want to, um, one, just uh, say something about what's happening with this course and then quickly turn it over to um, the team so that you can see their presentation. And um, the background of this course is that uh, we worked with GSMA 
the um, association that has every phone company on the planet, basically, um, and collaborated with them to offer this course, uh, which is about innovating in the intersection of 5G, what will happen in 5G, and using AI. And you're about to see uh, the nominated, you know, best presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, the presentation was um, previewed by a set of judges. You know, all the presentations in that class were previewed by a set of judges uh, that include basically the top technical leadership at AT and T, T Mobile, Vodafone, um, and who am I forgetting? Verizon, uh, and and we just had like participation from like everybody. You know, all like all the leading providers uh, uh, coming to this course. The one thing that I wanted to say before I hand it over, so that you can see um, this topic. Um, you know, uh, and of course, what we did in the class is that we're we're trying to have innovation be as real as possible in this space. That's really what we were doing. So anyway, the one thing I wanted to say was that this class and my other class, which I'll introduce later, DataX, both of them tend to have more technical content in them. So you're going to see not only the the uh, business story uh, of where the business can go but in these presentations uh and this is just kind of a pre-warning to the judges it's a little bit more balanced between uh the story and the need and so forth and also how it works and how they made it and what they did on the inside so that's just kind of a like um you know like a, a little bit of guidance for the judges in terms of what to expect on this these teams versus different teams okay with that i'm going to hand it over and um and give it to the drone 200 team i'll let them introduce themselves and take it away all right thanks awesome uh good morning we're the drone 200 team uh our problem addresses the um or our project addresses the problem of infrastructure related wildfires and as an example example we can consider the campfire in 2018 uh, this is the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California history with 85 civilian casualties covering an area of almost 240 square miles with most of this damage occurring within the first four hours. Investigators determined that the campfire was caused by electrical transmission lines owned and operated by PG&E uh, with a high likelihood of contact with uh, vegetation due to poor management. So our solution uh, it's a goal that uh, uses drones like the ones depicted here to remotely conduct periodic uh, electrical in infrastructure inspections, which would find areas with uh, vegetation that may contact a power line. Our solution combines the benefits of 5G environment listed here with the versatility and the remote operability of a drone. As the first step, we use around 2 million wildfire records that occurred in the U.S. from 1992 to 2015. Then we filtered out more than 1,000 fires that are caused by power lines, as we can see on the left. After we graphed the distribution, we prioritized size by two factors, the area with the highest fire risk and the mountain area that needs the remote control. As we zoom in, we can get the location information and spot fire sites in 2D area imagery. Then we found out that vegetation management is necessary. However, the potential problem is we don't have a 3D imagery to measure the exact distance between power lines and the plants. Therefore, our solution is to send drones for 3D real-time video streaming, as 5G has low latency. We developed a computer vision algorithm to measure the distance between the center line and the plants. This is our demo for detecting vegetation encroachment. Due to the pandemic, we simulate an environment on the balcony. Our drone streamed video which allows our computer vision algorithm to recognize the power line and measure the distance between it and the leaves. On the left-hand side, a Wi-Fi connected tallow drone is performing a short investigation task. This simulation is done in the kitchen with the stove fire. The drone is programmed to take an automated triangular path and streaming its video at real time to the back end. The right hand side shows how fire detection works in the back end. Our AI algorithm is running over the streaming videos and classify if each frame is safe. Like here, we detect a fire activity. Then the drone will send an alert message to the human end. As we examine the vegetation management market landscape, we can see drone inspection companies in the upper left quadrant and satellite imagery analytics companies in the lower right. Uh, combining companies from these two groups would surely provide competition for our product as it stands. However, our solution is already fully integrated. Also, we would benefit from the first mover advantage since we are developing our product from the ground up to leverage capabilities afforded by 5G. Our industry research showed that the utility companies in California spend about $250 million a year on vegetation management. And assuming that we can add maintenance to our product offering, our expected revenue per mile is about $940. 
our technology can also be used in various applications. For example, during COVID-19, we can use our computer vision algorithm to measure social distancing, which can be seen here. Our aim is to launch a pilot within our, uh, pg and R&D organization. Then we would incorporate maintenance in order to provide our first utility partner with a full service vegetation management offering that uh, assuming that the 5G um, rollout is complete. And so our ask is just to have feedback and mentorship as we develop this product in anticipation of 5G. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, if we're able to, I guess, to bring off your screen and judges, if you could all turn your screens on. Um, Zeke and James, please keep yours on and we can start the Q&A and feedback. All right, I guess I'll fire off first. I'll go ahead, Gabe. Oh, thanks, Jay. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your revenue and the market size and kind of how the business can grow? Absolutely. So uh, all, all of this is theoretical and it assumes that uh, we would get the buy-in buy from uh, CPUC, which is the utility regulator for California. And uh, because we were not able to actually develop a 5G product that we would present, um, we are assuming that we can get the revenue described at $940 uh, per mile. And so our plan would be to have the drone as the technology stands now to service an area of about five miles. And then depending on how many of those five mile sectors we could get, we would scale from the initial one drone offering up to potentially um, 10 drones. And then we would just expand from there, assuming that we could uh, provide a good uh, proof of concept with those, five, those 10 drones. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll poke a little bit more. So who are your customers then? Like, is there, is there only one customer in California? So there are 13 um, IOUs or investor owned utilities uh, that we we're targeting within California and uh, primarily about uh, just around 50% of the power line infrastructure is owned by uh, PG&E. So that would be, you know, the big whale. If we could provide a proof of concept with them, that would be the best. Um, but the, based on our industry research, we determined that we have to get buy-in from the, invest, uh, the, um, the regulators because they provide a lot of the funding. PG&E will provide the R&D opportunity, but the actual funding would be a combined effort between CPUC money and then the uh, line item budget from PG&E. And, and how much do they spend today in doing the equivalent work? So 80 million from pg and &E alone, 250 million in total for California. How about per mile as you're benchmarking? So it's, uh, that is an average amount. So, so $940 per mile assumes uh, it's a combination of distribution lines, which are kind of what you see within town, and then the transmission lines, which is the, the impetus for the, uh, the campfire. So those combined is about 267,000 miles within California, and that $250 million spend comes out to about 1,000, or just under 1,000 per mile. Uh, and you can use that, you can extrapolate that um, down to PG&E as well. Um, I have you... a quick question. Oh, go ahead. All right, I'll go. Okay, cool. Um, what, what prevents other advanced players in the space from just you know, copying your idea? What makes it so special? So that's a great actually, yeah. that's a great question, and we were considering that as well as we were looking at our, our market analysis, where we kind of um, grouped our two um, uh, the components of our project into the two businesses that are doing that now that haven't quite combined yet, but we see that as definitely a, a competitor uh, in them doing so. So our advantage would be one that we're already fully integrated. We're not having to go through some kind of merger and acquisition as we're going out into this burgeoning field. And then two, um, we are ground up developing for this 5G rollout. So all of our technology will be poised to do uh, beyond visual line of sight operations like we're envisioning, and we won't have to do any kind of adjustment once 5G is, is ubiquitous. Just a quick follow up. Um, sure. During COVID, have, have you like pivoted or because I we saw the entire um, social distancing mapping, right. are you planning to roll out something else or are you just trying to focus on the first product? So we, that was more of a comment about what is available with 5G, not necessarily what we're planning to do with, with our particular project. Um, that was just to show that, that 5G is going to open up kind of the floodgates in terms of, of new innovation opportunities. And it, ours is just one example of the myriad applications of 5G that can be um, exploited once 5G is completely um, rolled out. Cool, thanks. No problem. Thank you. This, this $250 million that you mentioned that is being spent just in California every year, do you see this number actually going up or going down? And like, what, what has the trend been for the while? And does, does, you know, what, does the, what does the future look like, at least from your perspective? So uh, that's a really interesting question. And speaking with um, a member of uh, Citrus Foundry, uh, Tim Barat, he, he provided really interesting insight talking about how the spend within pg and &E is $80 million alone. And so it's you know, a big chunk. In terms of the trend, I think that is, is kind of um, to be seen based on bankruptcies and future liability for other fires. Uh, so I really couldn't comment to that, but I would imagine just because of the, the, the public uh, safety uh, focus right now that that spend will go up as uh, regulators make sure that these IOUs, these investor owned utilities are increasing the safety factor and reducing the opportunity of these fires. All right, cool. Well, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there, but thank you judges and thank you team Drone 200. Well done. Thank you. Um, so now judges, if you can um, do your scoring and for attendees before we head to the next team, here we go with our poll. Alrighty, I can see that we have, um, let's 
see, about 65% have voted. If we can get that, that's pretty good. If we can get that to 70, that would be great. Anybody else want to throw in their vote? There, all right, perfect. Okay, Keith, back to you. Great, thank you, Melissa. And uh, thank you for that awesome innovation engineering uh, presentation. Uh, always great to see um, students using technology to make an impact and solve a really big problem we have here uh, in California. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce the 171 Technology Firm Leadership course uh, taught by Stephen Torres. Uh, Stephen is uh, a instructor for the, this course and also another one today. He's also an alum and an entrepreneur. And this actually is one of uh, SET's first courses that we offered since our, in a, at our founding in 2005. Uh, so I'm going to kick it over to Stephen, who's going to introduce his course and uh, talk about the team that we'll be presenting today. Uh, Stephen? All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I know my video is probably not on here, but uh, we'll see if that comes up. Uh, first off, I, I'm really excited to see everyone on this and watch all the startup teams. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of it. I, I want to put a little context. I don't know if that's me or if that's everyone. I want to put a little context of 171 because it is a little different than most of the classes that you're going to see today. It's actually a leadership class, not necessarily a project-based class. So when you see attendee here in, in just a couple seconds, I, I want you to keep in mind that this was actually one of four projects that the teams actually did throughout this semester. Uh, the other thing I think that's really important to understand is while they did this project, this was not the only thing they had to do. While they did it, they also had to read an entire book for the week to prepare for discussion. And they also had to do a case for the week. And then there was, oh yeah, this technical project on the, the very back end. This is actually the first time that uh, I've uh, invited one of our teams to come and share what they built during that couple of weeks with you because it literally is a, a three week essentially product sprint to see what they can come up with. Uh, they're given a prompt uh, to basically help take attendance and then they can build something around that. Um, so that's essentially what you're gonna see today is what they were able to build, design, test, all that within that shortened three-week time frame while also reading their book, doing their case, preparing for all these other things, uh, and of course, like everyone else, all the rest of their classes. So I'm excited to turn it over now to team attendee. We'll turn it over to you guys. Hi, how's everyone doing? We're team attendee from IR 171. I'm Abby, and with me are Annika and Ernesto. So let's fast forward to one year from now. You're the office manager for a large company and have just resumed in-person operations at your location. Employees are coming in, but you need to ensure their safety. How can you do this? Well, enter attendee, an upgrade to the traditional badge in process. Instead of simply swiping in, your coworkers will now undergo quick identification and a brief health check via a pocket-sized device that allows for touchless entry in a simple but ethical manner. So how does it work? Well, we start by taking your picture. This image data is then analyzed using algorithms for facial recognition and temperature analysis. You can see some of our Python code that does this on the right side of the screen. This ensures that each person entering the premises of your company is both a verified employee and not a health risk to those around them. Once confirmed, the image is deleted upon verification. If the algorithm detects an issue, the image is saved in an encrypted format for further investigation. We are able to do this with a handheld device that is smaller than the standard smartphone in your pocket. During our proof of concept tests with our IR 171 class, our product successfully recognized both students in this image. With higher resolution faces and less cluttered images, the results only get better. Our pricing model has two components, a one-time fee for each piece of hardware and a recurring annual fee for use of our facial recognition and temperature analysis servers. A sample client consisting of a large company with 30 entry points, for example, will net us over $30,000 in just the first year. With an $8.23 billion total available market, we have an ample amount of large companies to target early on. Medium companies will be addressed later in our timeline. Now for these next few months, we hope to focus on acquiring funding and further developing our software. Q4 of this year will be spent on hardware development and limited beta testing. As companies begin to resume operations in 2021, we will pitch attendee to them. In 2022, we hope to expand our product line by implementing versions for medium-sized businesses and schools. 
We are a team of engineers from SpaceX, Goldman Sachs, Heineken, and Amazon that is looking to deliver a secure solution for your company's workspace. In order to accomplish our mission of building a computer vision based smart access company, we're seeking $300,000. Most of this investment will be spent on research and development over the next 18 months. With your help, we hope to provide seamless access to workplaces in a productive, principled, and protected manner. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Abhishek. All right, so I think we have Anika and Ernesto. Um, if you guys want to put your screens on, judges, screens on as well. And Abhishek, if you can stop sharing your screen, sure. we can see all of you as you have the Q&A and feedback. Thank you. I can ask a question first. Um, so if I am the user, if I am an employee walking in, can you just walk me through how that experience would be like for me? And then on the other hand, how the experience would be on a person who's testing other people? Absolutely. So if you're the employee walking in, you would come into work, enter through the doors, and where the kiosk would be for your badge check-in, there would instead be our product attendee. And so you would face the product, it would take your picture, and then it would emit a message to uh, the person that is doing the testing and, and is uh, basically standing at the kiosk. They would receive a message of verified, at which point all of your data is deleted that was recorded in the past few minutes, and you get to walk through and resume your day. Uh, if there's some sort of problem with the data, maybe the image doesn't recognize you as an employee of the company, or it considers you at risk, it won't. It will keep the data as private as possible to protect your privacy, but at the same time, send a message to whoever's doing the testing that there was an issue with the data that we recorded so that they can do further investigation. And I guess does, um, does a product, is a product self-functioning or does a person need to be, okay, got it. Yeah, it can identify when a person walks in and, and automatically mm -hmm. work. And how many people have you tested so far? And how many, like how accurate has it been so far? Yeah, so we tested on a class of 40 students. Right now our tests have been on larger images with lots of people in the frame, uh, but our intended use for the product is to just have one person in the frame at a time. And our accuracy for large groups has been 90% and our accuracy with single faces has been 95%. Um, last question. Okay. Going forward, do you plan to add any other sort of features instead of just temperature and face recognition? Yeah, so the temperature analysis feature was something that we added very recently because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we realized companies are going to want to have multiple features to make their workplaces more secure. So we hope to add more features depending on what the situation calls for. But at the moment, we hope to focus on these two because we think that they're sort of at the top of, of most people's priorities in terms of how they want to secure their workplace. So we do plan to. Cool. Thank you. I, I have a question about um, the competitive landscape. What, what are, you know, so, you know if this is a COVID, it's all relatively new, but, you know, what are the other alternatives versus your sort of product right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we looked at a bunch of different alternatives that sort of do the same thing as our product. There are many across the residential and corporate landscape. So in the corporate landscape, there are many companies that are selling security cameras, but they aren't doing the level of analysis that we are attempting to do with our product. So they'll either just sell you a security camera or they'll try to sell you a camera that has facial recognition built into it, but they don't have the temperature analysis. And at the same time, uh, there are check-in systems that are using facial recognition, but that's being done right now prominently at airports. So uh, if you look at Clear, that's like a faster check-in system, they use facial recognition. Yeah, so... In the current validation steps that we've taken, we mostly conducted it with members of our own class. So we actually ended up pitching this product to them and trying to get their feedback. And the number one concern that they had was on the security and privacy of their facial recognition and their image data, because they, did, they, they wanted the exact opposite of that. They didn't want people collecting data of their, their faces uh, because they believed that that data could be sold to someone else or it could be compromised and hacked by someone else and then used for um, someone else's like ill gotten gains. So with that in mind, that's why we've chosen not to secure the data, but it's something that as we talk to corporate companies, based off of how their security policies lie, we would have to think about whether storing the data or deleting the data is the most ethical way to move forward. Right. I appreciate your mindfulness on the consumer end. Um, I would spend a little bit more time validating the corporate use case since you're selling to enterprise and you're taking away something that I think they would find more important, right? And they're assuming that this is a trusted environment. So if you come into my office, um, you know, there should be a mutual trust anyway. Um, and then the, 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 the treatment of that data should go along, uh, along with it. So, you know, if it was a public space like on BART, I could understand where privacy is a little bit more touchy perhaps, but uh, in the corporate setting, if you're gonna sell B2B, uh, it is something that you should hone in on. Alrighty, um, well, actually, I think we'll need to move on to the next team just for timing, um, but thank you so much team attendee. Well done, thank you judges. Um, thank you. Great. If y'all could um, go ahead and turn off your screens, I'm going to share the poll. And um, for audience members, um, we've been getting some Q&A that are directly to the teams. Unfortunately, um, we're not able to share that at this time. We do appreciate the questions. There might be a way that we could connect maybe afterwards, but um, for at least for this for, for right now, um, we're, we're not able to get those questions um, filtered through to the teams um, right at this moment. But meanwhile, what we can do um, is we will do the next poll. And I'm launching that now. If you could please set, put in your vote for team attendee, that would be great. Thank you. Great, thank you all. All right, Keith, back to you.
Great, thanks, Melissa, and thank you uh, to the 171 course, uh, Stephen and all the students and attendee for all your hard work. Very cool to see all that progress in just three weeks uh, and to adapt to COVID and uh, have that innovative way of uh, um, measuring temperature. Uh, congratulations, very cool project. Uh, so next, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our 185, one of our 185 classes, um, Challenge Lab. Um, so this one is our Alt Meet Challenge Lab course. Uh, so next I will introduce Professor Ricardo San Martin. Uh, Ricardo is a uh, chemical engineer, an entrepreneur, and an educator, and he's also the director of Alternative Meet Lab. Uh, so we have, um, so this semester, he's going to tell you a bit about this Challenge Lab course and uh, about his team. Um, so Ricardo, I'm going to turn on your video now and please go ahead and introduce your class and team. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me explain everyone a little bit about the Alt-Meet program. So the Alt-Meet program is the place where our students meet entrepreneurs, meet uh, venture capitalists, companies that sponsor our program, such as Givaudan, the largest manufacturer of, of flavors in the world, Nestle, Merck, uh, startups like Miyoko, and they work on challenges that those companies pose to them, or they come up with their own ideas to develop an opportunity in the emerging out, um, protein, alternative protein space. So they do that with following strict design principles that represent very well what CAL stands for. So it's not just about um, not having animals in the supply chain, but also making those um, products affordable to many people based on local ingredients, being healthy, and, uh, and of course, sustainable. So the team that won this semester, it represents very well these principles. And it is my pleasure to now uh, let you uh, learn more about this fantastic product that the team crop up have come up with. Thank you. Alrighty, Saman, I think you're sharing the screen uh, and Brittany as well presenting. If you guys want to mm -hmm. go ahead and turn on. All right. Hi, everyone. We are Crop Up and we're super excited to tell you about our delicious, realistic plant-based filet mignons. I'm Brittany, a plant-based chef majoring in business with a focus on food science. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm currently studying business where I specialize in marketing and accounting. The two of us met last year and immediately bonded actually during orientation when we both chose vegan chicken and rice at Bowles Hall. And these are our parents. My mom grew up on a farm in rural Michigan and is consequently one of the biggest steak lovers you'll ever meet. Recently though, she developed high blood pressure and cholesterol and her doctor told her that she needed to drastically reduce her red meat consumption. Same as my dad, he's a meat fanatic and also he experienced consequences from his meat obsession and got hospital hospitalized due to gout. We both know that there was no chance either would give up a steak, though unless they had a highly delicious and realistic replica. So we dove head first into trying to create one. We studied the microstructure of traditional steak and identified some highly functional ingredients, such as azuki beans, which contain the same three highest amino acids found in steak. Besides providing protein and texture, they also provided an added punch in terms of sustainability, as they can be grown using regenerative agriculture. Not only does our product look and taste like the real thing, you can see it, oh. <laughs> uh, it also has a ton of nutritional benefits, having 100% of the iron and protein content, but with zero cholesterol and a quarter of the fat. Our process, which is really easily scalable, begins by blending our ingredients together. We then create our fat and connective tissue. We can't share this part with you as it is a unique process that we plan to IP, but the components are then ultimately put into silicone molds and are ready to be cooked or packaged into our eco-conscious packaging. The market for our plant-based meat is growing rapidly with $801 million in the US. Our target market includes consumers who are seeking plant-based alternative for either environmental health or animal welfare reason. More specifically, we plan to initially target consumers over age of 25 with disposable income, and we plan to launch with a premium filet mignon uh, in order to maximize our profit margins and position ourselves as a quality brand. During our first year, we hope to reach 4% of the eight, uh, 840,000 consumers in the Bay Area who regularly purchase plant-based meats. We plan to first partner with high-end local steakhouses and restaurants to generate hype and gather valuable consumer feedback and build brand awareness. Then we plan to partner with California's grocery stores before expanding nationwide. To advertise, we plan to use target, targeted ads and endorsements. 
currently we have a unique product as our competitors are hot are either pre-launch and use difficult to scale procedures or old brands that do not offer the hyper realism and benefit of being a full cut of the steak. Our ingredient cost is just only 79 cents per four ounces. Therefore, our main cost will be to cover rent, equipment, and labor, uh, which we estimate is going to be $250,000 in the first year. Uh, by year one, we projected a net profit of $80,000 per year and increasing sharply to $500,000 by year two. Our parents could not be happier about our product. My mom pictured here eating the most luxurious filet mignon based tacos ever, <laughs> has been eating the product nonstop these last few weeks. We know consumers will have a similar enthusiasm for it once it hits the market. We are currently seeking financing of $250,000 to finance our first year of labor, rent, marketing, consumer analysis, and product testing. Thank you so incredibly much for listening to our story. We would love to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you so much, Team Crop Up. If you guys could stop sharing the screen, keep your videos on. Judges, if you guys could come on as well, and we'll begin the Q&A and feedback. All right. Um, let's see. Who would like to go first? I'll, I'll go first. That's a cool okay, product. Um, yeah, very, very cool product. Um, I'm curious about, so, so how many folks have you tested this with, um, you know, from a food sort of like taste test perspective, um, you know, outside of your, your sort of immediate family and friends? Um, so currently we haven't been able to do our like most, most recent one with as many people just because of the shelter in yeah, place. Sure. Um, but our version before that, we were able to test with a lot of people, like basically essentially every one that we knew family and friends wise. And um, even that one, which I think this one is way better. Um, was really, really well received in terms of its taste and texture. I had a lot of people think that, especially when it was cooked, that it was real meat and thought that I was messing with them. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, and, and also one, one very, very quick question as well too. Um, I, didn't, I didn't catch a slide about the price point. So how much would you, you know, sort of what is the price point? How does this compare to sort of like regular filet, filet mignon? So we would, um, once it rolls out into grocery stores, we'd be selling it as a two pack of four ounce. And we're thinking a price point around um, $16.99 for like the suggested retail price. Um, just because the more high end vegan, Meat products tend to tend to be around ten dollars, and since filet mignon is a premium product, <clears throat> we would want to price it. I think around there to make it kind of affordable and kind of a special occasion thing, but also something that you know had had some value in terms of its price. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, my follow up to that would be: you said that your family and friends tested it out. I was just wondering if you could give like an approximate number of how many folks that would be. I'd say probably around like twenty five people cool. total. Cool. And another question is, uh, how long would it take to get it to market? Like, what does the process look like and what's the timeline there? Um, so our product is really good right now. We've already um, developed the packaging and everything. We would want to test it um, to test its shelf life as of now. Like we have we have something in it to make to preserve it, to make it last longer. <clears throat> and I know that it freezes well because I've experimented with that. Um, but we're, you know, we still want to do a few things. And so I think we wouldn't be probably realistically rolling it out to restaurants for the next nine months or so as we finished up things but I think that we would be able to definitely like get it out within a year. And you said you wanted to I get an IP for it. Are you in the yes. process of starting that already? Um, we haven't started it yet, um, but we've, I mean, we've done a lot of research on it, but we haven't like actually started, we haven't filed yet. Okay, cool, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's unfortunate that we can't test this or try it ourselves. I think <laughs> last semester was chicken wings, plant-based chicken wings, and that was, you know, impressive. Um, so this is quite, quite exciting. Um, what changed between version one, version two, and like version three. Um, you mentioned shelf life, like is, is the taste texture on a blind test good enough to go? Or what's, what's, what do you think is lacking to make it like, you know, spot on competitor to existing meats today? So the taste and texture is really, really close um, as its appearance and smell when it cooks. The one thing that <clears throat> I think we would like to try to add more is something to kind of more like make it like bleed kind of like uh, actual traditional steak does. In terms of um, what's changed in the prototypes, Originally, we were having difficulty trying to make it without gluten. I don't um, know if you know much about <clears throat> producing plant-based meats, but often wheat gluten is used to bind it together. And um, I've been a vegan chef for 16 years, and they, I, I thought that there was no way <laughs> originally that we could do it without that. Um, and this one, we were able to do it miraculously without that. And it's better in terms of texture, especially for a flaming young, which is supposed to be more tender. It still has that bite. Like, I think, like, if it will let me show it, it still has, like, the give, that meat has, which is really amazing to me that I can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Well done. All awesome. Awesome. Um, I will have everyone go ahead and turn off their videos and we're going to take it to our poll. Great. Thank you all. All righty. Keith, back to you. Great. Um, thank you, Melissa. And thank you to the alternative. Uh, yeah, there I am. Uh, thanks to the 
Alt Meat team and class and your hard work. Uh, great progress on that technical problem of developing alternative meat products that are healthy and uh, taste good and have nice texture. Uh, really exciting uh, to see your prototype and presentation. Uh, so next we have our 191 class, um, Technology Entrepreneur uh, Entrepreneurship, which is a core um, class for SCT for students to um, create almost any new kind of startup and learn how to work with um, uh, work with Silicon Valley uh, and learn more about how to push your startup into the next to the next level. Uh, this uh, semester it was uh, taught by Rick Rasmussen and R. Paul Singh, and Rick um, is a Silicon Valley veteran uh, and good friend of the center and has been educating students in SCT for several years. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Rick, uh, who's going to introduce the class and uh, the winning team for the Tech 191. So, uh, Rick, I'm going to kick it over to you. Great. Thanks, Keith. So, yeah, as you mentioned, um, there we go. Uh, as you mentioned, 191 is a core class. It's the classic journey uh, for entrepreneurship. So we go through the process of allowing students to pick their own projects. Uh, they go through customer discovery, sizing out their markets, identifying marketing and sales plans that they think are appropriate, uh, doing some financials, which is actually really key to this particular course. And then at the end, we have uh, venture capitalists come in and students present in front of them. Um, this was unusual because this class we actually had a, uh, we started in January. We had just wrapped up a two week session, of almost a boot camp of uh, Korean students coming in. So our class kicked off with uh, five Korean projects presenting their final for our first day of class. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so we marched our way along the journey. And again, I'd like to thank Paul Singh for co-teaching a uh, great job, marketing and sales expert. He landed with a lot of credibility uh, to that subject, which is the board in the middle of our course, and also Ali Novalis, who is our course coordinator. Our project this time is Bear Space. So Bear Space is interesting. Normally, I don't encourage uh, projects that are student-oriented, but they ran across an opportunity that was so large that they went ahead and ran with it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the screen to Bear Space and let, you, let them tell you their story. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, for your great introduction. We are Bear Space, short-term housing for students by students. Uh, here's our diverse team. We're comprised of college students who've experienced the housing struggle, and we're all really passionate about student housing, and luckily we all met in Rick's class. We're all really committed to taking Bear Space outside the classroom and make it a reality this year, and we're excited to take our first step here in the Collider Cup with you all today. Now, Airbnb proved that people, especially millennials, are willing to share spaces, and the shared economy blew up. However, one very large segment that's missing right now and hasn't been well addressed is student housing. For example, here at UC Berkeley, we have 42,000 students and 48,000 of those students live off campus and sign year long leases. But what do they do when they go home for winter break, summer break, study abroad or a pandemic hits? Their space is left empty and unused. Thanks, Brianna. The problem of student housing extends way further beyond unused spaces during school breaks. Many students are getting scammed by existing services such as the UC Berkeley off-campus housing page, phony Airbnb listings, and Craigslist. In my sophomore year of college, I was in fact scammed searching for off-campus housing, nearly losing my deposit of $1,200. I spent many weeks looking for housing only to spend many more weeks arguing with my credit card company and my worried mother on the other side of the country. Keep in mind this was in the heart of midterm season, a time when Cal students will often forget to eat because they're so busy with their studies. And now I had to spend this time tracking down the UCPD and an Oakland FBI agent willing to listen. The Bear Space solution seeks to de-scam the housing search process for students. Only students can use our platform as we will verify student emails and student IDs. Bear Space will be free for students to use and post their spaces with a built-in chat to promote security. On the supply side, students have the option to boost their listings to the top of the feed for a small fee and can run a background check on the lessee whom they're leasing to. On the demand side, students are greeted with a personalized user-friendly experience with detailed video walkthroughs of spaces rather than outdated blurry photos. Bearspace is a two-sided platform as seen here and will be available in both a web and mobile version to promote student accessibility. As previously discussed, we will vet students by verifying either student emails or student IDs. For the supply side, our platform allows student lessers to post a listing, manage their posts, view student ratings, and discover students who are interested in subleasing. For the demand side, our platform allows students looking for short-term housing to search for available places posted by other students via a filtered search process and interactive map. Our mobile version will be very similar. Students searching for a sublease can view listings and features of each space and watch detailed videos in lieu of going on a housing tour. Video tours are especially important given the plethora of international students who are unable to view a place ahead of time 
and the current COVID-19 pandemic, making it now dangerous to go on housing tours. Thank you, Anthony. Bear Space will have two sources of revenue. Our primary revenue source will be a 5% fee on each transaction made through the site. An additional source of revenue is our premium placement fees that allow lessers to boost their listings on Bear Space. In terms of our market size, we estimate 1 million transactions in year five. So this equates to about $120 million in transaction fee revenue alone. For our timeline of expansion, we plan to launch in Berkeley this year to gain traction. In year two, we will expand to West Coast universities. And finally, in year four, we'll go nationwide. We are asking for a 100K convertible note for our launch phase. Um, this will be used to allocate towards website development and a sales and marketing strategy. And after year one, we estimate a need of 1.5 million. So overall, students are busy and the last thing they need is to spend months looking for housing. This is an untapped market of 20 million students and they are waiting for a solution. Bearspace is ready to provide this solution by facilitating off-campus leasing and eliminating scams completely. Thank you for listening and we are open to your questions. Awesome, great job. Love that you all have your matching backgrounds, it's perfect. Um, all right, so we've stopped our screen share. Judges, if you can come back on and we'll move into Q&A and feedback. Alrighty, Gabe, do you wanna start this time? No, I'm not. Okay, alrighty. Gabe, do you wanna start this time? No, I'm not. Okay, no. okay, all right, who would like to go? I can start. Um, so you mentioned that your competitors are basically Craigslist and Facebook groups. Are there any other apps I'm wondering in the market that do the same thing or any other competitors you can think of? Um, there's a competitor called Flip um, and they specifically focus on um, subleases. Uh, however, they're not geared towards students because um, we kind of, our brand is all about that we're, we're students that created this and we're for other students, um, but they are, they, they do the security factor, um, but they lack um, the student uh, perspective uh, on subleasing, and it's just a general uh, overview of subleasing. And then, like you said, Craigslist, Airbnb, mm -hmm. Facebook are like kind of the other mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. competitors. Um, I was wondering, have you tested it out with a couple of folks? Have you started user testing at all? Uh, we haven't run any betas yet. Um, we, the, I guess we are ready to start that following um, this course. Uh, we've developed um, all our financial statements and uh, kind of our revenue model, and we're ready to start beta testing after we've done a lot of market research. Uh, we've surveyed over 100 uh, students, um, and we are all active members on the off-campus housing page. Uh, Brianna is actually works for Cal Housing too. Um, so we, if we were, when we're ready to uh, start this uh, in the near future, um, or a beta version, uh, it, it wouldn't be too complicated to uh, get off the ground. Um, I, I have a quick question. Um, yeah, sorry to cut you off. I have a quick question. Um, so this is a two-sided marketplace. What do you, what are you going to build out first? Are you going to build the supply side? Or are you going to build a demand side? And where do you think you're going to have the biggest challenge? I think we're definitely focusing on building out our supply side first. I think if, you know, obviously we know that there's a demand from if you've ever gone on any housing Facebook page or anything, we know that students need housing that's mm -hmm. already established. And so it's important to build out that supply side. And that's why I think it's pivotal to build out that beta test and partner with Cal Housing. Currently, Cal Housing has something in place called Cal Rentals, which is not used by students because students don't trust Cal Housing. And I think at the end of the day, that's one of the biggest factors that we provide is the trust factor of providing a company that's by students for students. Um, yeah, one, one follow-up question. What does critical mass look like? So what, what do you think is a bare minimum on the supply side? Supply side is critical. What, you know, what, what do you think is sort of the, the bare minimum of listings that, that you would need to have to make this interesting or to sort of to, to get this marketplace working? I think to make it interesting, I'd like to see at least 50 listings to make it interesting. Um, but that being said, I think we can definitely get more than that. I think in our research, we found that on Facebook, there's what, there's over a thousand plus listings of people listing places trying to get subletters. And so if we can even get a fraction of that just to start, I think that'd be great. Okay. Um, my seeking suspicion is probably higher than 50, but thank you. Can you clarify have, a little bit? Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just one quick question. Um, COVID just happened. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are around that because Airbnb is suffering a lot, right? Because of COVID. So I was just wondering, I do understand that I'm international. So like I get that international students need housing, like if I was back in Berkeley, but just overall, how do you think that's going to impact your landscape? And yeah, that's a definitely, that's a great point. Um, Airbnb did just lay off, I think 25% of their workers. So um, COVID-19, um, comes around, but we're still developing this um, service. We're still developing bare space. So we're kind of entering at the perfect timing. So if this vaccine comes out in January, like they're proposing, and we kind of use our first quarter or two of development uh, for this platform and or testing, um, then 
we wouldn't be kind of introducing it until it's really, uh, the vaccine comes out anyway and people's fears are a bit more remediated. Um, there are also gonna be video walkthroughs so that uh, in case COVID-19 continues further into the future, uh, hopefully not, um, but students will be able to uh, view spaces uh, from different parts of the world. Um, and then also final note on that is students are not looking for long-term housing given the current situation. Like, I know I'm going back to Berkeley in a couple weeks, um, but I can't sign a year lease um, because I don't know where I'm gonna be in the fall. Uh, I don't even know where I'm gonna be in the spring. So I think the best opportunity for me right now is to sublease. Um, and so our platform is really tailored to that. Cool. So you. you'll, you're looking, you're estimating spikes to happen during breaks and in the beginning of the semester. Is that the right understanding? That's correct. Okay. And the value proposition when you started off was about, uh, you know, money lost due to scams. What's that look like per semester or per year? Like how much money is really lost due to scams um, at Cal, do you think? Um, the number, the specific number at Cal is um, not worthy of a huge, uh, it's, not a, it's not a huge number uh, because as students, um, it, and with the credit card companies nowadays are very, uh, for the most part, um, forgiving um, with uh, understanding the scams. Um, and then according to Federal Trade Commission data, 40% of scams uh, actually happen to people in their 20s. So most people think scams are just happen to seniors, just people who are incompetent or, you know, but students are always looking for a bargain. So the fact that, you know, 40% of, of that number is 20 year olds, is students, like that's, uh, that's a big kind of segment that we need to kind of address. It's all encompassing scams, not just housing scams though, right? What percent of that is housing scams, do you think? The percentage of that is housing scams, it's always 15%. Um, but yeah, the 40%, the, the and it's not all for students, let me be clear on that. The 40% was all 20 year olds uh, or people in their 20s. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that sort of answers your question. But yeah, there's not too much data on that for uh, UC Berkeley other than just like the housing page. Um, yeah. Cool. All right, well, thank you judges and thank you team Bearspace, well done. If you guys you. could shut off your videos, that'd be great. And we're going to move on to our poll. All right, here we go. All righty, last votes, there we go. Thank you all. All right, Keith, back up. All right, okay, I'm back. Cool, uh, thank you for that presentation. Definitely, I'm sure anyone who's looked for um, housing in Berkeley area Recently, I've been helping a friend myself and there are so many scams out there. It's not a very fluid market. So you guys definitely identify the really big problem and hope we, I hope the best of luck to you and you can make some great progress on this idea. Uh, so next, it's um, my pleasure to reintroduce Stephen Torres. Uh, Stephen, this semester was also the instructor for our 185 Challenge Lab uh, Sports Tech and Human Performance course. Um, so Stephen, again, is an alum of the center, an entrepreneur, um, and has been a great friend and educator for SCT for the last uh, several years. So Steve, I'm going to kick it back to you so you can introduce um, the Sports Tech course and talk a little bit about your team. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, hello again, everyone. So this semester was certainly for all teams, one of those crazy semesters that we may never come across again. And you know, one of the things we love about um, these classes in particular is to watch these teams go on their entrepreneurial journey. You know, there's usually a point in each semester uh, where there's a, a pivot that comes around and the pivot either comes of uh, two things. There's either desperation or inspiration and sometimes both. And this team that you're going to hear from uh, certainly was one of those teams. And they really stumbled upon something that, you know, has one of those huge markets, but is also fun. And so in our sports tech and human performance uh, uh, genre, we're able to actually see something that can be pretty big and we're excited to share it with you. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and turn it over to team Break It Down. Team Break It Down, go ahead and take it away. Can you guys see the video? We can. Yeah, great. we can see the screen. Thank you for the introduction, Steven. We are Break It Down, bringing business to dance one move at a time. While you may have seen Drake's Tussie slide, have you ever heard of May J. Lee choreography, over 150 million people have. There are thousands of creators just like her posting videos on YouTube and TikTok in the hopes of making it big. <clears throat> YouTube has unknowingly become the go-to platform for dancers, making $360 million off hip hop dance tutorials alone. This market is rapidly growing but there is no platform that allows dancers to learn and sustain their dancing skills. Introducing Break It Down, the first social media dance learning platform of its kind. You'll find popular dances to all the latest hits 
that you can learn and share across any device. Once you've found your desired routine, we've built learning software that one, automatically identifies the most difficult moves, two, slows them down according to your skill level, and three, allows you to loop through the moves so you can perfect them. Now, here's a demo of our software in action. Hi guys, my name is Yuki. I made this choreography for breaking down. YouTube isn't designed for learning. Slow motion options on YouTube are extremely limited and their platform forces you to guess what speed is right for you. In addition, you have to manually rewind to the start of each move you find difficult. Unlike YouTube, learning on Break It Down is customized for you. Our algorithm ranks each movement and exaggerates the hardest ones while leaving the easier moves closer to real time speed. At Berkeley alone, there are thousands of people learning dance just like me. And beyond this community, choreographers are uploading YouTube videos every day where millions of people are struggling to learn. We will become the marketplace that brings choreographers and dancers together. Choreographers will gain recognition and monetize their content, while dancers will perfect their craft and establish a dancing community. Our four market makers enable Break It Down to infiltrate the market right away through their loyal fan bases of 83,000 dancers. Our initial goal is to create a community of content creators and dancers by leveraging our market makers, social media advertising, and outreach throughout the Bay Area dance community. To support our dance community, Break It Down will be free. We'll monetize this traffic through targeted banner ads, eventually layering in paid premium services for both sides of the market. We'll leverage this growth in virtual learning and hip hop dancing, since its popularity gives us the broadest reach. Going forward, we see Break It Down expanding into other dance genres and sports. Just as we're connecting dancers to choreographers, let us connect you to this untapped multi-billion dollar market. Thank you. All right, thanks team, Break It Down. You can stop sharing the screen. Judges, you could turn on your videos and we'll go into Q&A and feedback. All right, uh, judges, who would like to go first? Um, I have a question. Are there any other apps right now doing the same thing or anyone you could think that could be your direct or indirect competitor at the moment? Uh, to answer your question, uh, thank you for the question, but there are no other competitors out there right now that are using and utilizing this slow motion algorithm like we are. There are other social media platforms that are used for dance videos and stuff, but no one has the technology mm -hmm. that we have right now and that we are implementing through our product, Break It Down. And how are you planning to bring your first uh, customers on both the supply and the demand side? Um, I'm going to pass that question off to Kanal. Yeah, so on the, on the supply side of choreographers, we have the four partners that we highlighted. And those are four partners who each have large fan bases that they're going to attract to our platform. In its partners is the director of UC Berkeley's largest dance club filled with amateur dancers. So we hope that he can push that out within the Berkeley dance community to begin. And dance, as, dance, as you, you may know, is very socially interconnected. So we hope to leverage those connections to help raise the awareness about our platform by word of mouth. Have you thought about integrating a social aspect to it? And if you have, what does that look like? Have you thought about integrating a social aspect to it? And if you have, what does that look like? Yeah, so the platform, we envision it to be a social media dance, a social media based learning platform. So in addition to being able to learn videos from choreographers, newer dancers will be able to upload their videos and potentially even get feedback or comments and responses from other dancers with suggestions about their form and things like that too. So we definitely see it being social from both the dance, the choreographer standpoint, interacting with new dancers, but also new dancers interacting with each other. Do you have any current users at the moment? We, we haven't been able, we haven't piloted the platform yet. We've been mostly networking with choreographers to build out this network of mar our, what we call market makers to help us drive growth. Mm -hmm but we haven't piloted the program yet, but excited to do so in the fall. Cool, thank you. How much have you actually thought through the business model of the, the ad-driven business model? Um, and I'm saying this as feedback, the ad-driven business model is really, really awful um, because you need massive, massive reach to sort of make that work. So how do you think about it? You're gonna sell your own ads, you're gonna partner with one of the ad networks. How, how do you think about that? I well, think in terms, go ahead, Pinal. 
in terms of the ad business model, I think, um, I guess to start off with in terms of as a business, we're extremely low cost to get this off the ground. It's some software development cost and marketing. And in the short term, our marketing cost will also be pretty low because we'll drive user acquisition through our partners. But as we do seek to grow revenue and balance those costs, um, we will probably partner with um, advertising companies. And the main value that we think we add is that our ads will be targeted towards a specific demographic of dancers. And because advertising companies are able to target this specific demographic, dancers are let more tolerant with the ads that they receive because they'll be relevant and advertisers are willing to pay a higher premium because it's a specific demographic that they're able to target. Follow-up question then. So how much research have you done into sort of possible CPM rates you're going to get for this? I haven't looked into the CPM rates to be perfectly honest yet. So, so I'll, I'll just say like, you really, really need to dig into this. Um, I come from the ads world. So for example, CPM, CPM rates go down every single year. And so think about this, right? So you're getting say hypothetically like 50 bucks per CPM, right? Which by the way, is very, very high and, and not totally realistic. But if you just do the math on like, okay, so you get like say 83,000 users, you need to go do a forecast and actually see what the number looks like. Um, I think you might be very surprised on the negative side. So just some general feedback and thoughts. And I will say that we will be announcing this at, um, at the end of all the presentations. So we'll all get to hear who is the winner of the people's choice as well. Thank you again for voting. We appreciate your participation. All right, Keith, on to you. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for that uh, great presentation from our sports tech and human performance class. Um, can you guys see me? So, oh, there I am. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, one thing I've learned about Berkeley students is that they love to dance. So I'm sure that you're going to find plenty of customers uh, here in Berkeley to participate in your app. Uh, very cool um, venture project. Okay, so next up we have um, our 185 class blockchain, uh, emerging technologies and social impact. Uh, so this course is uh, taught by Luke Kowalski. Luke is one of our industry uh, instructors. So in his uh, spare time, he's a vice president at Oracle. Um, so we appreciate um, all of Luke's um, mentorship and help to teach our blockchain course for the last couple of years. So Luke, uh, can I take it over to you for a bit of introduction about the course and your team? Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the uh, video is starting now. So um, thank you to Keith and thank you to uh, Ken and Niklak um, for the opportunity to, to teach and see all of these wonderful innovative um, ideas coming from Berkeley and the Sotardja Center Challenge Labs and other classes. Uh, this one happens to be disruptive technology and social impact. So it involves blockchain, fintech, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, as well as machine learning. And there are four components to the course. Uh, the first one is the Berkeley Entrepreneurship Method. And we introduce students to, to concepts through, through videos and through uh, games and, and other content. The second one is the notion of design thinking and, and you know, iterating through, through your work as you create your ideas and you form your startup. Um, and also the concept of having empathy for the user and trying to get at their requirements and wants and needs before you actually design something. So many times I see um, in corporations, and I've worked in both startups and large corporations, where people just start designing without talking to the intended uh, end user and without establishing the user persona. Um, then the next component of the course is, is you know, the creation of the actual startup. And, and I think that's nice because it allows the students to have actual artifacts uh, that they can use during job interviews. So they will have a PNL. Uh, for their startup, they will have a prototype. Uh, they will have uh, a go-to-market uh, plan. So all of these things can be can be then shown uh, as, as something concrete that they've done, and which can hopefully help people uh, gain employment. And then the last component of the course is guest lectures. So that's the pragmatic real-world perspective where students can ask questions about what people have experienced in their startups. Um, and now onto the team that won and got nominated to go to the Collider Cup, and that team is Real Deal. Uh, they have shown that they sort of hit the, uh, you know, the right two things. You know, what's in the title of the challenge lab here? It's just disruptive tech and social impact. And they've done exactly that. And it's a very timely solution because the problem of unaffordable housing was pretty big before COVID. I'm afraid it's only going to get worse. So I want to turn it over to the Real Deal team. And I am very proud of them and excited to, to hear their pitch. And I hope you are as well. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. All right, Real Deal, you're up. Great, just making sure my screen is visible. Okay, I will begin now. Imagine heading home, excited to see family, only to know that you have to move. With the coronavirus outbreak, the one thing that we all have is the love of our families and the security of a shelter. And just imagine losing that. That's what happened to Anna. With the temporary loss of jobs, her parents are no longer able to pay their mortgages. But our solution, Real Deal, will help our friend Anna and many people just like her, giving them a new place they can call home. Good morning, everyone. We are Real Deal, 
undergraduate students united by our personal housing struggles here in Berkeley. Together, we cover all ground, engineering, business, and design. We have two mentors who have provided us with invaluable guidance, especially on real estate finance. Last year alone, 100,000 novel housing units were introduced, priced at double the median cost of Bay Area properties. One million people in the Bay Area need affordable, accessible housing, a number that's too big to ignore. So how can we solve this? RealDeal provides affordable, accessible housing by introducing a novel use case of fractional real estate ownership. RealDeal splits the price of a property into 30, 70 percentiles, 30 percent to live and 70 percent to invest. Smart contracts, decentralized record keeping technology designed to instill trust in the authenticity of digital transactions are the perfect alternative to existing siloed databases and inefficient transactions. But let's make this clear. Imagine wanting to buy a property worth 1 million, but only being able to rake up 300,000. There's no way one could think of living in this property. However, with real deal, one only has to pay 30% of the property price to occupy it, in this case, equal to 300,000, while an investor pool covers the other 70%, purchasing shares of the property to then earn returns from its appreciation value. Very common in the Bay Area. Real deal is able to provide in this manner, safe long-term real estate micro-investments. Of 30 interviewees and 250 surveyed respondents, we found that 90% of people said they would use RealDeal. We bring to you lower costs through efficient resource pooling, eliminate the middlemen in real estate transactions, and lower the income threshold necessary for investment. What once took two weeks to process, now will only take two days. Our initial area of focus is the Bay Area, with a median house price of 996000 and around 2.5 million homes, a conservative estimate, which brings our market to be valued at $2 trillion US dollars. With this, we become an asset for the middle income tier, who currently face a shortage of 12 million affordable homes. Our go-to-market strategy is exactly to target this area, focusing on housing units near universities as well, conducting pilots with university real estate groups. We use Ethereum smart contracts to allow users to transact in both cryptocurrency and general currency, the first to leverage this. Smart contracts bring transparency, real-time updates, and no room for miscommunication. We will collect transaction fees for each smart contract initiated, a 1% fee paid by the seller for our services as real deal, and finally, a 0.5% asset management fee paid by investors to ensure steady streams of revenue. Our five-year financial projections show that we break even in year four with a deficit of 350K before profit. So now let's see Real Deal in action. Our front end is easy to use and simple. It is interactive, colorful, and connected to a back-end smart contract. On this contract, one simply has to input the sender and receiver address, as well as how much money is to be transacted in US dollars or cryptocurrency. Our backend then automatically transfers this to Ethereum, executing the final transaction in cryptocurrency using stablecoin APIs. With RealDeal, we create social impact. We help alleviate homelessness, giving people so many more options for shelter, a right that everyone deserves. We help 83% of working professionals in the Bay Area stressed about housing prices, and you could be one of them. Check out our executive summary and our full demo video in the chat. We bring to you a real deal. Thank you. Nice, awesome job, guys. Um, all right, if you could take off the share screen. Um, judges, come back on. And we're going to go into Q&A. Um, I will say we're getting a little short on time, so I'm probably going to have to be a little more uh, aggressive with cutting all off. My apologies. All right, Gabe, I see your hands up. Thank you. I'm going to ask about five questions in one. So <laughs> on. Sure. Is, as an investor, am I senior debt or equity? If I'm equity, what liability do I have? As And then there's quite a bit of compliance with regard to making loans to retail residential. So if you could address the senior debt versus equity, if equity, how I mitigate my liability and the compliance issues. So first I can answer the compliance issues. Like we mentioned, one of our mentors is actually a real estate broker. And when we were developing this idea, we wanted to make sure that you know we're compatible with the legality of this procedure, because of course, if we don't meet the law, we can make this um, idea happen. And the real estate broker told us exactly this. Technically, um, this is an idea that is scalable. And we saw that Stanford actually conducted this um, experiment, experiment not too long ago, and it was successful. So in terms of you know being compliant with the legal aspect, it is. As for the liability, there's no liability because the amount that one wants to invest is on themselves. So dependent on how they think the property price for this property listing is going to um, shift, they can invest whatever amount of money they want, which is why we're a platform that enables micro-investments. I would be careful with those answers going forward. I've done a lot of this business. I don't agree with that. But... 
we can talk more. Okay, sure. We are looking to guidance, so that would be a great insight that we could have. Um, I have a quick question. So if I'm someone who's facing this problem and I have no idea what you guys do, how, in a simple manner, how would you pitch that to me? Like if I'm a user and I didn't know that the solution exists, because I feel like, yeah, just go ahead. So we know that blockchain is technology that while everyone has heard of as a buzzword, everyone might not be familiar with, which is why we paired it with a front end that's very easy to use for people to understand. Um, if you look at our full demo video, you'll see that we've broken it down into chunks where we navigate exactly what part of our website is used for what. And it's also segmented into both, you know, the user as an occupant and also the user as an investor. And so all our marketing is going to be simple, not so technical. And the technical work is going to be done by the back end work that we've integrated into this platform. So as a user, you actually don't need that level of technical knowledge and the easy to use interfaces will give you all the information necessary for you to be a, plat a user on our platform. Cool, thank you. Thank you. If there's any other questions, we can probably take one more, but then we do have to move to the next just to keep things going. Mm -hmm. Judges? No? Okay, great. Thank you, Real Deal. Awesome job, really well done. And um, all right, if you all could turn your videos off, we'll do our poll. Thank you, thank you. All right, and here we go for Real Deal. All right, audience, if you could please vote, that would be great. I'll also just say a friendly reminder, thank you again, everybody, for attending. Um, and while we really also would love to engage with the audience for during the Q&A, we unfortunately just don't have the capacity during this event. But if you are interested in connecting with a particular team for the event, please feel free to email SCT-OPS, so that's O-P-S, uh, at berkeley.edu. And again, SCT-OPS at berkeley.edu with a team name, and we can put you in contact. And again, sorry, just that we're, or, you know, we're, we're limited in just how, how the Q&A and chat can go but um, there is a way that we can put you in touch um, post-event. So, and we really appreciate that you have these questions and are wanting to participate, so thank you. In the meantime, we've got about 10 more seconds for this poll, so if you can get your final votes in for this team, that would be great. And looks like Keith is ready to rock, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, thank you very much to uh, the Blockchain uh, Social Impact course. Um, definitely, that is a great way to get more people to have the opportunity to get into the housing market. Uh, so yeah, next we have our last 185 Challenge Lab section for today. Uh, Emma Zugel. Uh, this is a uh, course taught by Shomit Ghost, who's a venture capitalist and has been a friend of the center since our founding in 2005. And we very much appreciate his uh, coming to Cal and uh, teaching this class with our students. So Shomit, I'm going to take it over to you for a very brief introduction of your course uh, and your team. Thank, thank you, Keith. So um, I'm Shomit Ghost. I've been teaching the uh, Emma Zugel class for the past three years. Uh, Emma Zugel is a class that teaches the strategic use of data in business, specifically in the same manner as Amazon and Google, hence the course's name. And in our class, we learn about uh, multidimensional data sources, how to leverage behavioral economics, and how to always exercise ethics, data ethics. Of course, all built upon machine learning. Um, students also build a, a, a term project in teams. This semester, we have eight teams. And uh, today, we have one of those teams, Team Prospect, presenting a project. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Team Prospect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shomit. I can go ahead and share my screen. Hi, everyone. Our company is called Prospect. And our goal is to bring climate change considerations into corporate decision making. I would like to introduce you to our strong and diverse team. We each specialize in different areas such as machine learning, data engineering, full stack development, product design, financial analysis, and environmental science. One of the biggest problems our world is facing is climate change. And this problem is not going away anytime soon. From the graph on the right, we see that over 40% of greenhouse gas emissions are due to transportation and corporate activities. Although most companies have sustainability agendas, only 2% of companies are able to achieve their sustainability goals. With that, we would like to introduce you to our company called Prospect. Our mission is to use a multidimensional data-driven approach to reduce the environmental impact of corporations. Our four main services are corporate travel, employee commute options, meal catering, and new office locations. For the time being, we will only focus on implementing the corporate travel service, which provides corporations with the most sustainable locations, dates, and times to hold conferences and summits. Then we plan to expand into our other services once we build our customer base. Our prediction service and behavioral economics platform follows this feedback loop. We first start at the bottom left of the cycle with data retrieval. We use proprietary and external data to predict the carbon impact, AC usage, and eco-friendliness for each venue. We then use these metrics to recommend venues that a user is most likely to click on. Finally, once the user makes a decision, we will gather this information and store it for future use. Here's an overview of our tech stack. When a user visits our website, they submit a query, which then gets passed to our API server. 
We then perform real-time predictions using our models stored in Postgres. Let's take a closer look at our market size. There are about 5.6 million companies in the US. Of these companies, 66% have serious sustainability goals. Research shows that business travel alone typically makes up over 50% of a company's greenhouse gas emissions. So if we just focus on this particular aspect, we see that $283.6 billion are spent on corporate travel each year. We believe that companies are willing to spend 1% of their corporate travel budget to meet their sustainability goals and save money along the way. Our subscription model allows for companies to focus on what fits their sustainability needs and financial budget. Additionally, we provide a six month free trial, which helps us build our customer base. Given our multidimensional approach, there are no companies doing exactly what we're doing. When discussing our go-to market, we use companies that are similar to specific strategies within our company. Based on our financial projections, we see that our customer bases are growing or will be growing about 70% in year five with an estimated growth and revenue of $40 million. Our expenses will go towards product development and marketing. Using future financing, we plan to broaden and strengthen our customer base and lower customer acquisition cost. We are looking for initial funding of $250,000 for Prospect. And now we are very excited to show you the product we have built. This is the homepage of our website. Suppose you work for a company and you want to book a venue for a conference or event, simply enter your information and preferred venue type. And uh, for each of our recommended venues, we display an eco score, AC usage score, and carbon impact score. We would like to thank you all so much. And now our whole team is happy to take your questions. Thank you. Great, awesome job, Prospect. We'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, for those who are answering Q&A, please put your videos on and judges as well. Like I said, I'm gonna have to kind of speed some of this along. So let's jump right in. Who would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. Oh, um, real quick, so who do you sell into in the corporate? So like ESG and managing CSR relations a separate division and operating business unit. Um, have you identified how you actually sell into a corporation? Um, so we'll start by partnering with smaller corporations who are very invested in um, very invested in their sustainability plans. Um, so corporations who are really struggling to meet their sustainability agendas and goals. And so we start to focus on these select few companies, um, especially smaller companies who have um, sort of like a smaller scale of operations. And we aim to see which aspects that they're currently struggling with, such as corporate travel, employee commute. Um, and we aim to provide them with sort of customized sustainable options, see what works for them, and then try to go, try to gain a bigger customer base uh, based on what works for uh, like the smaller companies that we uh, partner with. I'd like to jump in real fast uh, and add a little uh, bit more to that. Um, so at the core of it, we're a data-driven company. Uh, we're the ones providing information and predictions. Uh, and it is also advantageous for us to partner with other companies that provide these sort of services for companies. Um, so uh, there's like trip actions um, that exists in this area providing um, uh, uh, trip services to companies uh, and also commute services, uh, commute service companies uh, that help uh, deliver reimbursements to employees or manage this sort of space. And so partnering with them would be, would put us in a good position to deliver services to these companies, but also focus on our core product, which is the predictions and analytics. So I really like your idea. I'm part, uh, mentoring a team at CU Boulder that actually has a very similar idea. So it's I think the idea is catching on in terms of the concept. Uh, as much as I like it, my concern for the idea, and you can address this, is that it's relatively easy to copy and Expedia will just, if it, you catch on, we'll copy you. But the, the last speaker, Eric mentioned that if you're really the data partner behind the scenes, I think it's a better business model than being a standalone. It's just too easy to copy. So if you want to comment on that. Yeah, um, I'd actually like to comment on that with, with an example, if I may. So um, I'm sure a lot of people at Berkeley are familiar with Venmo. Um, we use it all the time to, to do transactions between people. Um, in the past few years, Zelle has come up. Um, I've never used Zelle before. Um, I actually just used it last night to, to pay um, my landlord for the first payment of, of, a new, of a new lease that I'm signing, right? And I think the reason why Zelle has been able to kind of push their way into this space is because they partnered directly with banks to provide a little better service to the people. I think Zelle exists in the background, um, also as the sort of data collection and, 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 and sort of prediction services company, as opposed to handling all the transactions um, like Venmo or PayPal is doing. And so they, they're partnering with the banks in order to kind of exert themselves in the space um, to help them kind of ice, uh, uh, insulate themselves from outside pressure. Good. Thank you. I'd also like to add on to that if possible. 
So um, I think one of our core differences is our proprietary data streams that these other companies don't have. So in addition to offering these bowling pins that we're trying to solve like corporate travel, commuter transportation, et cetera, we're also able to offer an API service that these companies could integrate into with instead of us integrating with them, they integrate with our platform. I had a quick question. Have you guys thought about plans that are customizable? For example, like if I'm a company and I just want to focus on catering and not transportation because it's, I don't know, people telecommute or whatever, like, because I, from what I understand, there are three different um, models right now. I was just wondering if it would be potentially more beneficial if you could provide them with like a, like, you know, 10 customizations and they could choose and then be accordingly priced. So what are your thoughts on that? It's definitely an option for us. Um, I think, like Sona mentioned earlier, um, we do we don't want to spread ourselves too wide yet, um, just because we are this we are thinking of this more of like a pilot program. So we think that we want to focus mm -hmm. first on corporate travel, build our customer base, develop mm -hmm. our modules, our infrastructure, all of that, um, and then kind of think of more ideas moving forward. That has been um, an option for us in terms of kind of more customization um, on a client by client basis. Um, but once again, we do want to focus first on establishing our customer base, get that down first, and then we can kind of look into how can we customize all these options for each of our clients themselves. So the first users you're planning for um, small businesses, if I understand correctly. That, yeah, that would be kind of our main target. Um, first start, start off there and then. Start off there, we would go with the smaller businesses. Yep. Okay, cool, thank right. you. Cool, thanks guys. Sorry, I'm gonna have to cut it off right there, but really good job team. And um, thank you judges. Um, alrighty, so we're gonna turn their screens off. We're gonna quickly go into the polling. So audience members, get ready. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, uh, Team Prospect. Great presentation, really cool prototype, and uh, thanks for working on a very uh, big problem. Uh, so next is our uh, other section of our 191 course. Um, this one is uh, taught by Professor Naeem Zafar. Uh, Naeem has been one of our longest running instructors at the center and has certainly made an impact on hundreds, if not thousands of students who have gone through our program. So Naeem, I'm going to kick it over to you and ask that you make a brief introduction of your course and team. Yeah, thank you, uh, Keith, very much. This has been a cornerstone course in IOR. And basically we go through the whole process. Teams of four or five take an idea, do all the market research, conduct between 50 to 100 interviews to refine the thought process. And then they put together the go-to-market strategy, the financial plan, and the final exam is a pitch to the venture capital panel of VCs. So we have successfully ran this course for the last you know, 10 plus years. And it's been very exciting to see the current set of people who have uh, worked very hard. And uh, I think we're gonna hear from the team and that there were several good teams, very hard to pick which one but this course has been very popular and we are so proud to present to you today. Great, thank you, Naeem. All right, so um, we have Team Tamarin and I think it's Juliana will be, should be up with the presentation. And then we also have Niklas, Rintaro and Sophie. So if you guys wanna bring your screens up, you are, you have the stage, perfect. All right, you can go. And if you're speaking, we can't hear you yet. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, go for it. Awesome. Thank you. So, hi there, we're Tamarin. Tamarin is a financial services company revolutionizing the toxic and predatory practice of payday loans in the United States. Payday lenders take advantage of desperate customers who are excluded from reasonably priced credit and charge horrendous fees to customers who already struggle financially. Tamarin has the goal to make consumer credit more inclusive and bring an end to this absurdity. So the current reality in America, 74% of the Americans live from paycheck to paycheck, which means most of the Americans have nothing left in their bank account in the, in the end of each month. Looking at credit scores, 40% of young people under 40 have a FICO of 620 or below and cannot access traditional credit products. Therefore, every year, 12 million consumers in the US have no other choice and take payday loans and pay extremely high fees to those. In 2018, American consumers spent $9 billion on fees and interest for payday loans. And interestingly, those payday loans were used in seven out of 10 cases to cover recurring payments such as rent, utilities, and food. Tamron's solution to this problem is a subscription-based service where consumers pay a small monthly fee and an exchange can take out credit for up to $500 when they need it. With Tamarin, there's no hidden fees and no extra charges. Our target customers are young, have limited credit history, and therefore a low FICO. They have an average income of $20,000 to $45,000 a year, but face very high cost of living, leaving them with a little financial flexibility. Payday loan customers pay on average $520 in fees per year, 
with our solution, we reduce the cost for the borrowers by 77%. Unlike traditional credit providers, Tamarin does not rely on the FICO score, which is misleading, especially with young people, as it measures past credit history. By applying for Tamarin, customers share alternative data with us, such as their spendings, their education, and housing situation. We can see how, who our customers are and how they, how they make and spend money, and we use that data as a proxy for their financial responsibility. Like this, we look at the entire financial picture of a person and are able to predict the ability and willingness of a person to pay back credit. There are 113 million young workers in the US, of which 45 million have a FICO of under 620. As FICO is very misleading with young customers who have no long credit history, we make the conservative assumption that even if only one out of four of these people are actually financially responsible and able to pay back a credit of $500, we can estimate 11 million customers who need our service and would be eligible for our product. Assuming $120 recurring annual revenue per customer, this leads us to a market size of 1.3 billion in the US alone. This is our business model. Customers can only take one credit at a time, limiting our exposure and their debt. We finance those loans by borrowing from our bank at 6% annual interest. Tamarin partners with several gig job companies to refer relevant extra streams of income to the customers, such as they can pay back the credit more easily or do not have to utilize the credit in the first place. In combination with our savings advice, we minimize the need of credit for our customers, hence lower the credit utilization and our cost. The less a customer relies on the credit, the better for both of us. Having analyzed all costs associated with our consumer loan product, our model can realize a gross margin of 65%. Like this, we create a great business opportunity while making credit fairer and helping people to have a healthy financial life. Looking at our financial projections, we would need about 1 million in seed for the product development and the launch of our first version in year one. That's it. Um, thanks for the attention. All right. Thank you very much. We could close the share screen. And for those who are going to be in Q&A, please turn your videos on. And I will let you all take it away. All right, judges. Yeah, I, I guess I can start. Um, I mean, there, there are other folks trying to tackle, you know, other fintech companies trying to tackle the, the sort of like the payday sort of like loan sort of like industry. Um, tell me a little bit about who, who else you look at as your competition. Yeah, so there are several companies. For example, there's something like, um, like Earnin, who lets people like get access to their paycheck and people upload their work hours or they give GPS data to prove how much they have already worked. And the company can see what would be your paycheck balance and they can get an advance on this one or pay active and daily pay are integrated with employers' payroll systems and give people the ability to check out their paycheck earlier than payday. But we say this is only part of the problem because these companies focus on giving people access to the money they have already earned. But we see the problem more with the FICO score, which is actually excluding a large part of the population from any kind of credit and therefore limits their ability to overbridge uh, financial issues. Also, our, our um, product is more tailored to people who have actually several streams of income which is very much the reality of many payday loan customers. And these customers are actually not, um, they can't use these solutions like even or earn it because those approve, like need proof from one single employer as the stream of income. What, what is, um, you know, your, your business model, all, all these types of business models break at some level of like default rate. What, what, is, what is your breaking point for your, for your business model? So we, we calculated this with a 3% um, def, um, customer loan loss provision, which is based on data from public payday lending companies. So this is the money they, they pra practically lose because people don't pay back. But since payday lending companies actually don't do any kind of credit check or actually take on any risky customer, we would be much better than that because we're actually looking at the financial data of a person and can assess how financially responsible that person is and how likely that person would be actually be to be credible and take the credit and pay back. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Probably um, one more question. question. Yeah, cool. Um, I think on one of the slides I saw that uh, it said something about selling data to third party users. So I was wondering if you could just explain that. So of course we would, uh, we would have great aggregated data about demographics and industries which are actually um, chronically underpaid because those people don't earn enough to make um, the, the, 
to pay for their living costs. For example, we thought about working together with unions. So this kind of data would actually bring evidence that people who work in a certain industry in a certain area are actually not able to finance a decent life and pay their rent. So this kind of data would, for example, be interesting for unions to um, look at um, what give leverage to their negotiations as one point. Of course, and um, the data about what kind of how financial behavior of certain people and demographics are is very interesting for many third parties in this regard. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm having to speed things along here, but obviously we can have connections afterwards if as needed. Um, but yeah, great job, Team Tamarin. And um, so if we could turn some videos off and going to get this poll going. So audience members, please be ready. And here we go for your votes for Team Tamarin. Maybe I'm saying that with too much of an accent. Um, all right, Keith, do you want to come online? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Team Tamarin. Definitely, um, this is a much needed. Uh, product and it seems like you guys had a very thoughtful approach. So congratulations on your hard work. Uh, our next course is uh, Declassifying the Planet. Uh, this is a course that I believe it's the second time uh, it's been taught. Uh, our instructor is Dirk Christian um, and Dirk is going to tell you a bit about um, the course and the team that uh, he selected to compete today. Dirk, I'm um, going to take it over to you. Thank you very much Keith and uh, uh, pleased to talk about the big problem. Plastic pollution is a big problem and this class explored how entrepreneurial solutions might help to solve it. Thank you to my co-lecturer, Mathieu Agues, and our fantastic course coordinator, uh, Veronica Kargay, for going through the last four months together with me and all the pivots that we had to do. This class is organized uh, by UC Berkeley together with School Lab San Francisco, and five companies offer challenges to the students to choose from. Danone asked us how we might reduce plastic in bottled water, and Samsung, with two challenges, asked one team to envision a future where robotics and robots contribute to a plastic-free world. And a second team, how IoT could help reduce plastic in households. Foresia asked us to replace the 350 kilograms of plastic in each new car with natural fiber sourced locally. This was a continuation of last semester's work. And Method, together with Whole Foods, asked us to address plastic waste in supermarkets. And our team, that, is, uh, go, that you're going to meet in a minute, our team up cycle, responded to this challenge to explore how waste from supermarkets might be repurposed into products to be sold in supermarkets. The result will surprise you. It can be done. Our team has the solution. They figured out the technology. They secured their first customer and all the pieces needed for a local pilot in the Bay Area. And the majority of the team wants to continue with this project. So here, uh, without further ado, meet team up cycle. Hi, Gert. Thanks so much for the introduction. I'm going to share our screen now. You can see it. Looks good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, hi, everyone. We're Team Upcycle. Um, did you know that every year, 90 million tons of plastic packaging is produced worldwide, where 80% of it lands up in the landfill or our environment? We are Team Upcycle, consisting of Jenny, Joey, and myself an interdisciplinary team that is energized and invested in deplastifying our planet. Our challenge prompted us to look at how waste streams from Whole Foods, a supermarket chain, can be created into input materials for Method, a sustainable soap company. During our research, we learned about PHA, a bioplastic that is made from organic feedstock and is compostable. Full Cycle Bioplastic is a company based in Albany that produces PHA pellets from heterogeneous organic waste inputs. So we saw an opportunity to transform the organic waste of Whole Foods into compostable packaging materials for Method. During our interview phase, we identified three pain points. How do we ensure that our consumers actually compost the products? How do we deal with the complexity of waste infrastructure and collect the organic feedstock? And three, how do we stand out amid similarly sustainable packaged products? Our solution, let's turn cardboard and food waste from grocery stores into uh, compostable packaging. Here's a simplified diagram of what our supply chain looks like. Our product is a fully compostable bottle lined with PHA bioplastic made by fermenting food waste from a grocery store. With its sleek, sustainable design, this bottle is not only eco-friendly, but can also decrease the barrier to cost for sustainable materials. The system will be kept fairly local in its test run, we have buy-in from three major stakeholders for each step of the way. Our product embodies the circular economy model, making sure that we're not just sending more materials to pile up in the landfill. So let's say goodbye to that annual 90 million tons of petroleum-based plastic packaging. 
and let's say hello to the compostable bioplastic of the future. There have been other packaging marketed as sustainable, but they aren't fully compostable within the 60 day cycle most industrial composting facilities run on. Bioplastics like PLA can also be quite costly to manufacture and don't really break down all the way. Our packaging can overturn the current market dominated by petroleum based plastics and can be used to package vitamins, juice, coffee, beans, and more. We found that environmentally conscious consumers are less price sensitive. In a small survey, 84% of respondents would pay more for our product over competitors. However, this won't be necessary. Full Cycle offers one-to-one -one pricing against petrochemical plastics. By using free feedstocks, we'll actually see marginal cost cuts. Our research shows a growing environmentally conscious market worth 4.5 million in the East Bay alone. Expanded to the rest of the US and Europe, that's a $3.1 billion market to contend for. With backing from both our partners, we'll be able to launch the significant market traction. So far, we've done a lot of the legwork to prepare the supply chain, design our spearhead product, and to see how stakeholders respond. We went through five prototype iterations before settling on PHK lining. If you look at the two boats, the unsinkable one with the red X has a PHA lining on the bottom of it. PHA works great for our design because it's waterproof, can be easily melted onto many shapes and surfaces, including my little paper boat. And it works without adhesive. Our ultimate goal is to co-found a bioplastic plant with full cycle adjacent to method soap production in Chicago. This would allow us to produce packaging on site to reduce shipping and benefit the local community. Going forward, we envision our minimum viable product being ready by October, bioplastic production in Chicago within 18 months and applications to other products going forward. Thank you for your interest and we'd be happy to field any questions. All right, awesome job guys. We got it. Okay, took the share screen off, great. Judges, come on back. And for those who are participating in Q&A, if your videos are on, great. And judges, I'll let you take it away. I'd like to, I have a, sorry, go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. Um, I didn't hear your ask clearly in terms of dollars and uh, are you looking for money or mentorship or? Right now, we're looking for $200,000 to reach our minimum viable product. And that includes several, several uh, sequence of prototyping and then 1.5 million to establish a plant, but that's down the road. Okay, thank you. Cool. I have a question. Um, I'm curious about two things. Why Chicago and how did you onboard your first customer? Well, so Chicago is where uh, Methods Soap Manufacturing, the soapbox is located, and mm -hmm. we thought it would have the most efficient stream of, um, I guess, packaging in order to have that um, plant be really close to where the soap is manufactured. Um, and we were kind of given this challenge by Whole Foods and Method, and Method um, gave us a lot of mentorship into this project. Cool. Thank yeah. you. I guess, uh, what's, what's the timeline look like? Suppose you get all the funding you need. Like, how fast can you expedite um, research and development? We think we can have our first product out by October, and then within 18 months have a uh, plant in Chicago producing bioplastic. Are you guys planning to go full-time on this? If we get the money, yes. Very cool. Well done, Upcycle. Looks like a really cool product. I like the little demo there with the little boats. <laughs> so, all right, everyone just turn off their screen. We will head over into polling. And Keith, I think you're going to be up here in a minute. Okay, cool. Uh, great, um, great product upcycle. Very uh, nice work. Okay, so I think we have two presentations left. Thanks everyone for um, for bearing with us. We're a little behind, but I think that um, uh, these next two presentations are going to be very uh, worthwhile. Um, worthwhile. So um, next, um, I'm going to. I guess. Okay, sorry. Next, uh, our next class is um, applied data science with venture applications, also known as Data X. Uh, so this course was uh, um, taught this semester by Arash Nurian. Um, but um, I think we have um, Iklok coming back to give a short introduction of the class and um, the, the team who won. Uh, Iklok, I'm going to kick it over to you. All right. Okay. Hi. All right. So uh, yeah, Data X. Uh, Data X. So first of all, uh, thanks to Arash who really led the entire class. He couldn't be here uh, uh, because he's um, <clears throat> uh, got another activity. But um, I wanted to say a couple words about Data X. One is uh, this is a very applied data science class. Um, it has like both the technology and the theory, and it also has a very open-ended project. And um, you know, we always seek uh, in a class like this that um, that it is very real life in the idea that um, uh, in terms of technical innovation. But not all projects are in that course 
are venture oriented. They can be, you know, anything. Uh, we had other projects where uh, teams are, you know, helping, you know, Volvo or car companies on um, imaging, to, you know, on AI solutions or, you know, like, so there's different kinds of projects in the class, but this, um, we nominated a project that uh, for this one that was closest to a, um, to the venture category. And for that, I'd like to bring up uh, or, you know, ask the team uh, UI image to uh, take over and represent data X. So uh, I'll hand it over to you guys now. Great, thank you. All right, your image, you're ready to go. I can see your presentation, so take it away. Thank you. Hello, we are team U image. Our members are Mu Xuan, Jocelyn, Xinyue, and Yu Chen. There is a significant growth on websites or apps that promote users to upload photos. Businesses that are spending manual efforts to tag those photos which is time inefficient and cost consuming. On the customer side, traditionally users typing keywords to search for stores or restaurants. However, there are many cases that the things our users want are hard to be described in words, but are just similar to what's in the photo. So we've come up with the solution of using an image classification system to tag photos. On top of this system, we designed some user interactive features. So to describe our business, you image in short, it is a B2B business which provides image tax related technical support and user end add on features to our partners. And our vision is to broadcast stories told by images. So now let's look into details of, uh, of our image classification system. Our system is built by training convolutional neural network models on a large set of labeled photos. And in real application, it takes one or two photos as inputs and outputs a set of photos that belong to the same or similar classes as the input photos. By using the output tags generated by our system, we will get and store users' personal preference tags. These individuals' tax data, together with other historical activity data, will be used to support our specially designed user end features, including search by images, which addresses our users' pain points that previously discussed. Searching maps, which helps users find local areas that have restaurants and stores that may attract the user most. Manage personal preference tags and content-based personalized recommender system. And here is our UI prototype. Here is a short demo of our user interface in mobile apps. This is the homepage of Yelp. We see at the bottom, we have a new section. Guess what you like. Users can see the shops recommended by our system based on each user's tax data. If users click into the next page, then they can see and edit. We also envision that some users may find it hard to describe a store or shop in words, so we facilitate them to search for shops or stores by uploading photos. Users may click on this image button over there and upload photos. Got it. Upload photos from my phone and find shops now. Here is a list of shops that our system finds it most relevant to our users' preferences. Users can also find their tags here. We trained seven CNN models on five thousand label photos and used Euclidean distance and cosine similarity, these two evaluation metrics to compare their performances against our baseline model. We found that ResNet aiding has the best performance. Image related products can become a new trend, especially when people having access to cameras and millions of videos at the tap of a finger. They are highly useful to many fields or industries like service industries, entertainment industries, e-commerce, social media, etc. Since our business provides image-related add-on features, there are many potential partners that we can reach out to. And we have listed a few here at the bottom. Secondly, due to the nature of our business, we can make profits by taking advantage of economies of scale. And we may quickly expand our business once we have successfully put our idea into practice with our first partner. Last but not least, just like our slogan goes, we want to broadcast stories told by images, and we do hope we can make people's life much easier in this way. That's for all for our presentation, and thanks for listening. We are open to questions. Great, awesome job, UI image. All right, if you could close the share screen, and for those participating in Q&A, if you could turn your videos on, judges, take it away. I'm not sure if you've thought of
about this, but how are you planning to monetize this? Uh, we, because we are because going, we are going to just make an uh, image classification system first. Then we have we will first design and just try to uh, make all our uh, user and features uh, that can that can be used. And we will try to uh, negotiate with our partners to try to to see if they have the interest to put our features on their own apps or websites. And then we can just cooperate with them and uh, make income from that. Are you collecting any data? Uh, collecting data. Uh, uh, yeah. What data you mean? Sorry. Yeah. Are you like from like from your users? Uh, actually, so once you have users on the platform. So once you have users on the platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, actually our ahead, project ahead. was mainly on the technical parts about the image classification system, the neural network. And uh, I, I do think we need to work more on the market research and on the potential customers on this side. And we will try to find like the more potential partners that we can cooperate and, and, and to know more about their customer size. Yeah. And I will say that we're not trying to store our customers' data. Yeah, we'll, we are just trying to build a tool so that the, the end customers can have a more customized and mm -hmm. a improved experience when using uh, those apps that they're already familiar with. Mm -hmm. I have a bit time for probably one Quick more question. question. What prevents big companies like, cool. What prevents uh, big companies like Yelp from just, you know, getting PhDs in data science from doing the same thing? Like what's so special about your product? Uh, I would say that in like during the initial phase, um, it's not going to be that attractive. So I would say that the best part of, of mm -hmm. outsourcing our product is to save money and save time. So they don't have to like hire an entire team to do that when we already have like a mature product, like just ready for them to use. Yeah. But like, I feel like in the initial phase, like the initial phase of this product would be the hardest part. But once we have like a mature product, then everything else will be like easier. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, in the spirit of time, we're going to have to close this one here. Uh, but great job, UI Image. Thank you, judges, as well. Um, so everyone turn off their screens. We'll move over to the poll. So audience, please be ready. And here we go, launching. If you could vote on UI Image, what you think of that team? And Keith, over to you to start entering our last, but certainly not least, presenter. Great. Um, thank you so much, UI Image. Great presentation. Um, and yes, next that we have our last presentation of the day. Um, and this is from our bootcamp course, our Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship Bootcamp, which we offer every uh, semester. And uh, this course is taught by Gigi Wan, who's a great friend of the center. And Gigi, I'll let you kick it away to introduce uh, your course and your team. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know, the uh, Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship Bootcamp is the intro to entrepreneurship course that we do at SCET. And it's a four and a half day course where the students uh, come in, they form a team, they you know, identify an opportunity, and develop a startup plan all in one week. At the end of the week, they present to uh, a whole set of industry judges, including venture capitalists. And um, it's 100 Berkeley students, 30 external students, and throughout the week, we have 30 speakers and mentors come in that work individually with the team. So it's what I call an Instapot. So out of the 24 teams this spring, we had three finalists who presented to a panel of three venture capitalists and uh, IPCLOC. And one of the finalists was a team called Seawarden. has a very exciting value proposition, which I will let Zach Ding, the founder, tell you about. But one very important piece of the news about uh, Seawarden is after the class, Zach continued building the team, and he also got selected to go into the Haas Business School Social Venture Accelerator where they were given initially $5,000 to continue working on it. And then um, three months later, uh, that C warden won first place in that accelerator and received an additional 15,000. So I'm so proud of Zach and the team from C warden. And I'll let Zach tell you about his company. Okay, everyone can hear me now, yeah? I can hear you, I think, yeah, just press present. Perfect. Um, yeah, Gigi, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, we really learned a lot this semester and uh, I'll, I'll start there. Um, so my name is Zach, and I really like seafood, um, but I've been concerned about how my diet impacts marine life. And so I'd like to share today um, our, our idea of advancing transparency and sustainability within the seafood industry. So today, half of all seafood is actually farmed, and seafood farming is the fastest growing food production sector in the world. Um, the last fish you probably ate was likely from a farm like this one. 
um, we've discovered that many farms lack the technology that they need to farm more sustainably. So farmers like Giannis here um, want to sell fish, but it's not so simple. 80% of North American retailers have adopted sustainable seafood sourcing policies. This includes Whole Foods, Costco, and even Walmart. If you're a farmer, your farm needs to be certified in order for you to get into these markets. The problem is, despite the demand, only 5% of seafood, in seafood is actually certified. And so, sorry, my uh, something froze. There, that's the story. Sorry. Um, so we understand the problem really well because my co-founder Shelby is a seafood auditor. And together, um, we figured out that the process takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, it requires the farmer to collect many documents and for the auditor to come travel thousands of miles to the farm location to inspect equipment, review documents, and conduct lots of interviews. And this could take at minimum $13,000 per year and it happens every year. So we validated our concept. Um, by speaking to several, um, several different organizations in the industry. And the most important was the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, ASC. They're the largest certifier of farm seafood in the world. And they said remote auditing would give more seafood farmers the opportunity to become certified, while more frequent audits would further legitimize their program. And, for more, and even more important right now, because of COVID-19, remote, au remote auditing is desperately needed. So we've developed a process to remotely conduct audits using satellite observation, image capture using mobile phones, and a centralized data management system. Uh, extracting, satellite, extracting data from satellite imagery is my field of expertise, and we are using machine learning to audit several key certification metrics. Here you can see that Giannis's farm has been verified to be in the correct location and has not exceeded the production capacity. Currently, we are monitoring every single farm in Greece using this method. Uh, Greece is one of the largest producers in the Mediterranean. Furthermore, we're able to provide useful insights to predictive modeling. Here you can see that um, fish, uh, uh, fish can, you can see how long, how long it'll take for fish to reach harvest size and how much waste will be produced during that time frame. Using mobile, using phones, we're able to cover all remaining aspects of the audit, such as verification of important documents, um, verification of fish feed, and calibration of sensors. All data is stored in the cloud, making prep for future audits easier. This process is similar to online tax filing. We apply machine learning to analyze documents and images to speed up the review process, while also generating useful insights. Our competitors have not been able to meet the demand of farmers because their labor-driven business models as consultant groups um, cannot scale. So our business model is twofold. We address the issue of certification by partnering with programs like ASC to gain access to farmers. And then once that connection is made and we're connected to their data, we're able to provide further services um, of data analytics that can op optimize their operations. We plan to offer our services at prices similar to other enterprise level products like Salesforce. And doing so, we believe the total addressable market is nearly a billion dollars. We believe we can reach $25 million by year five in revenue. Um, having an initial focus on certification will allow us to be profitable early on while positioning us to be the primary provider of data analytics for, the, for seafood farmers, which is our long-term vision. In collaboration with ASC, we will be testing Seawarden in June. This will allow us to further refine our approach. Our initial target market is located in the Mediterranean Sea, where farmers here have a high potential for technology adoption. Shelby and I started Seawarden because of our mutual shared passion for ocean conservation, and we've built a dedicated team uh, to support us. We expect to acquire our first customers later this year for testing and launch with ASC in early 2021. We are considered hopeful candidates for Hatch, a technology accelerator dedicated to seafood farming technology, and we hope to join them in August. And with that, I would just like to say thank you for everyone at Berkeley who has supported us, and uh, we'll take, I'll take any questions um, from, from here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Zach. I have a quick question. What um, geographical locations are you targeting after Greece? Um, the rest of the Mediterranean. And then from there, we'll probably move up. We're going to move to Southeast Asia, where there's a lot of production in that in that region. Cool. 
and you don't have you're going to start active user testing in the next couple of months next month yes next month cool thank you one, one question i have for you is about the fish farms what are the biggest concentrations of, of fish farms um right now like what, what are the, the sort of like key centers because i my understanding was that i think like isn't it like the the baltic region is fairly strong in this area and chile um but i'm just curious i i i know the hatch guys very well so this has come up before so i'm curious in your view yeah so 15 countries only 15 countries represent 97 percent percent of all marine production china is one of the largest markets norway chile and canada are large producers of salmon and salmon is actually an industry we're trying to steer away from because they have high levels of technology utilization already yep. and so there's a large demand in the remaining markets okay thank you it's a clever way of using satellite imagery is that is that resolution going to be good enough to really identify just the, the details of compliance um, yeah, absolutely. So right, so right now we're using half meter imagery, but they're, they're, which is very good. Um, the thing is like, there's only so much you can actually get from satellite imagery right now. In the next few years, there's going to be larger advances where you'll actually be able to detect like contaminants and pollution and nutrients directly from orbit. But those technologies aren't, aren't mature yet. And that's why we have the secondary component of using pretty standard image capture technology to supplement all the remaining um, tasks. I had a last question. Um, out of all the people that have fish farms, how many of them have easy adaptability to technology? And how are you planning to get the others on board? Right. So the technology bit for a lot of farms is it's, it's very difficult, right? They're, these people are out in the field. They're working. They, mm -hmm. They're on water. Like technology and water doesn't really mix. The thing is, um, the re and this is the reason why we're targeting certification, is because this is the number one pain point that we keep hearing is what they need help with. Once we can get them with certification, it'll, it might open them up to more technology. It's almost like I did my taxes a, a few weeks ago, and the last box like was, would you like to spend 30 more dollars to ensure that your taxes are, are done properly? It's going to be stored for another like five years in a secure place. And for me, that was very easy to say like, yes, I'll spend 30 more dollars. And this is the kind of data analytics um, we would provide after certification that gets built directly into the, into the process. And everyone needs certification. So that would be like the good point of entry. entry. Exactly. If you want to, if, if a farm wants to sell in a in a, a developed market like the in the European Union and in the United States without certification, they're they're not going to be selling at the at the highest price points. Exactly. Right. Cool, cool. For the sake thank of you. time, we will have to close this one. But well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, judges. And um, so we and so now um, we're going to have our final poll. So, audience members, please get ready and put in your votes here for Sea Warden. While this is happening, we are going to hear from Gabe from the Intuitive Foundation, who is going to briefly speak with us about what is the prize and what's happening next. Thank you. Just wanted to compliment all the teams. I know this is a hard and stressful process when you're all in school and you're able to meet together day to day. So I really compliment you for being able to stick together and work remotely. You know, many of you are in different continents as your team members. So I think all of you should view this as a win. I think there'll only be one or two or three winners that come out of this. Uh, but I think just going through this process, taking the risk, and going through this was really wonderful. So I, for the teams that win, congratulations. For the teams that don't get a prize today, I think you still won just through this process and still stay with your ideas. Uh, just wanted to quickly go over the evolution of the Dopkin Foundation, what we're doing. It came out of uh, Robert and Kathleen Dopkin's donation, but Robert starting linear technology down in the South Bay, having enlisted a NASDAQ for 35 years. We, Bob and I have worked together for the past 15. And it came out of the, just the growth of his desire for technology and entrepreneurship and the blending of them. So the foundation's going to offer up to $100,000 to a team or teams that are selected today. That's not a, a guaranteed prize, but it's up to 100,000. And well, I think we're gonna offer four or five one-on-one -on -one meetings with the, a few of the teams, and then also make introductions to them, to the founders of many of the companies that we've invested in over the years, uh, where they can, the founders can add some strategic value. So to all the teams taking the risk, getting on stage, presenting, I know it's scary. So I think that's a huge win and congratulations for doing that. I'm going to step out and go vote with the other judges and thank you for letting us and the foundation participate. Thank you so much, Gabe. And yes, thank you so much, judges. So now the judges are going to literally step out of the Zoom and go into Google and um, we'll deliberate. And while we're doing that, and that's happening, um, we're actually going to have Ken Singer come up for a little bit here. And he's going to speak about our um, our winners for the teaching awards. So Ken, if you're yeah. in so the I need building. To be, uh, it says my video has been stopped by the host. I am changing that right now. Give me one second. All right. All right, and you should. Okay, so it looks like we're great. So, um, okay, so we've got two awards to hand out. One is for um, the uh, best instructor uh, th this semester, as well as the best student coordinator. Of course, all of our instructors and coordinators are fantastic. Uh, this is a prize that we hand out um, to recognize um, 
uh, outstanding teaching and uh, student support. And it's all uh, comes from our students who are in the classes themselves, as well as staff and, and faculty who work with, uh, with these teachers. So uh, without further ado, I want to hand out the course coordinator uh, award. Um, this is, well, um, Melissa, I know one person has a video that's teed up and the other one ha wants to do the slide. So which one should I announce first then? Um, doesn't really matter, but um, if we want to start with course coordinator, who actually she said she's going to speak live, um, we can, we can okay, start great. with her. So let's start with her. So I want to announce Jen uh, is our course coordinator um, of, the, of the semester and uh, she has some comments that she'd like to share right now. Thanks. Here we go, Jen. Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. And I had so much fun. Course coordinate for Professor Iklaxi, who's um, innovation engineering class. Um, this is a really rewarding experience. I learned from him and from my students, as well as all the SET staff gave me so much support. And I'm really uh, charging this opportunity. And I thank you for the award. Perfect. Thank you. And I just want to point out how difficult of a job it is to be a course coordinator, because not only do you have to be in school and learning yourself, but you're also running around being kind of the um, the shadow for the instructor as well as the support person for the students in the class so it can be a full it feels like a full-time job sometimes right Jen and uh, and it's very difficult to make it look uh, seamless and um, and uh, effortless and from what I understand Jen you've, you've done that this semester uh, from all from all people who have talked about you and, and um, so thank you for the for the semester um, so now moving to the, um, the instructor of the semester I want to uh, first say uh, this person is one of my favorite people on the planet uh, he is brilliant, but also super funny, and largely the reason why I know so much about Chile, as well as uh, my terrible Spanish. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, uh, hand the teacher of the, of the semester award to Ricardo San Martin, who I think has a video teed up for us to uh, accept. He, does, he does indeed. So I'm going to share a screen along with sound, and hopefully this all works. And it's brief, so here we go. I'm really happy and honored with this award. I just want to find words to say thank you for everyone that have trusted in me, that have given me the means to really have this great opportunity to teach Berkeley students. You don't know how rewarding this is every day to come meet them, well, not anymore, but meet them by Zoom and just learn from them. The students are at the center of everything we do at the CET and this award is really for them. Thank you so much. I think I might have only shared the sound, but that is Ricardo. <laughs> My apologies, but you've heard the thank you. And Ricardo is here. I think uh, he's called in, but I think he wanted to make sure he had that recorded and uh, shared. But um, some of the comments from the students, he had multiple nominations from students, uh, but consistently we hear that uh, Ricardo challenges the students to learn things that are absolutely new, things that he hasn't even worked on himself, which is, you know, if you see the projects like this, the food, um, culture, and meats uh, projects, they are, um, you know, indicative of the work that he does with students, undergrads uh, especially, to get them to do things that uh, haven't been done before. So, um, so good. I, I, I think a lot of the other instructors are on this call, so I just want to make sure you guys know it has nothing to do with you guys not being awesome. Ricardo um, certainly um, shined this semester. Also, um, I don't think all of the students hear about this uh, this award, so it will be in you know if you can all promote this within your classes as well, we'll get a better uh, view of the of what's being taught in class, um, and we can share that in um, in this award next semester. So I want to encourage you all to to promote this um, this award next time. Um, Melissa, anything else you want me to? That's that's all from your end. I feel like they're not <laughs> no, back yet. The judges always take more time. You're you're good. We're actually going to move over to Iklok, and he's going to be speaking about um, innovation that matters now. Okay. All right. So um, uh, th this is a, a chance to give me give you um, like two minutes of update in terms of what are some of the new things that we're thinking about. Where you know, kind of where are we going with projects for the center? And um, I think the background for this, uh, in case you haven't noticed for some strange reason, over the last three months, the world completely changed. And um, the, you know, the, the issues with both health and the finance, the economic uh, changes that have happened because of that, uh, it really is starting to affect everyone. Um, and we're all kind of going through this, I'm gonna say journey together of all of these changes. Um, you know, everyone is adapting in different ways. Companies are learning to stabilize and then reposition themselves to grow. And in the middle of all of that, uh, you know, one thing that we realize is that even innovation is changing. And um, and so 
there's a number of things that we're doing to focus on what I would say matter the most right now and to help all the people that we work with focus on what matters. So that includes things like uh, we announced a uh, COVID RX type of initiative. Uh, basically, that's about sharing best practices between companies and between our students and so forth. The idea is that people would um, let us know what's really happening in their companies and translate that into problems that Berkeley students can um, can get access to and, and start to do things with these companies as they adapt themselves. And we're also, you know, realizing that some of the things that are very glossy in terms of innovation, things that we've seen before, say at Media Lab, MIT Media Lab, or Singularity, uh, some of these things are like really long term, how will the world be in 10 and 15 years, 30 years, or whatever. Um, but for uh, a lot of, you know, but but innovation itself now is much more about adapting to all the changes that have happened right now. So, um, so we are, you know, working on a new set of labs also to work with firms and universities to focus on that. So all of that goes under that category of innovation that matters now. And um, it's just like a little glimpse into some of the more things that you're going to be uh, seeing over the, over the year and how that's going to re relate to more opportunities for Berkeley students to get involved with um, both startups and innovation projects uh, around the world. All right, so that's my uh, update. All right, thank you. And did you want to speak specifically about the um, COVID RX initiative or? Um, I, I mentioned it um, kind of in passing, but basically what's happening with the COVID RX initiative is that we're starting with an, um, an innovation, innovating under adversity uh, series, and we're going to be inviting uh, people from different companies to help us understand and help them share best practices, like what's working for them and not. And that the immediate next step will be to connect Berkeley students to the issues that they're seeing. Um, if you want to be on the mail list or you want to get in touch with us about any of the things that are happening, or if you have either a startup or you have a, um, like either you're a company that wants to engage with it, or you're even a company or a person that wants to help others, we have a, uh, um, a, a form that you can uh, fill in so that we can find you and uh, and um, contact you. So if you go to our website at the top, there's a button for COVID RX initiative. You can click on that and find a form on that page. And that's how we can invite you more directly to the things that are related to, uh, to your interests. Great, thank you so much. Alrighty, so um, we are, the judges are still deliberating, but what I can do in the meantime, and I guess you would like to turn off your video for now. Oh, yeah. um, cool. All right, so what we do have is we have the winner of People's Choice. Um, so I will go ahead and announce that. And then um, as we're still waiting for the judges to deliberate, you guys can take a bio break. So there you go. Um, all right, so the winner of People's Choice, and I wish I had a sound effect, but I'll just do the, the table. People's Choice Award goes to Seawarden. So congratulations, Zach, well done. And um, I don't know if you wanna say a few words for the People's Choice, but if you're still, if you're, if you're in the building here, um, feel free okay. to pop in and um, yeah, you've won People's Choice. Um, wow, that's uh, that's quite amazing. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for, for voting for us. Uh, yeah, we think we're working on something really important. It's nice to see other people think so too. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Zach, and great work. And all right, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm going to try and put on a little music. And yeah, if you want to kind of take a little break, stretch out a little bit, I'll be back in about, I think we're probably going to need about five more minutes, if I had to guess. Um, and uh, if there's any changes, I'll let you know. But please do come back so that we know um, who's going to be the final winner. Okay, cool. All right, so I think we are ready to share the uh, our winners for this year's Spring 2020 Collider Cup. Is everybody ready? Melissa, are we ready? I think we are. Um, are the judges coming on or are you just, are you presenting? I am going to present on behalf okay. of the judges. Okay, cool. Um, so thanks again, everyone uh, who participated um, in this year's uh, Collider Cup. Thank you to the audience members for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you to uh, the staff for putting this together and the faculty for all their hard work uh, this semester to teach our courses. And of course, thank you to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 800 plus students who worked really hard throughout the semester uh, on their venture projects. And to the 11 teams uh, 11 teams today who participated and worked really hard on uh, their presentations. Uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, um, you know, no matter uh, who is winning today, uh, everyone who's participating today and in all our courses uh, should continue to work on their our ventures and get feedback and push it to the, the next level. So without further ado, um, you know, typically uh, we only um, select three, the top three kind of winners for the Collider Cup, um, but the judges um, just couldn't uh, select only three. So this year we actually are selecting four winners. 
So the first uh, honorable mention, uh, number four, or tied for three, third place, uh, is Team Upcycle. So everyone, round of applause for Team Upcycle. Um, great work. Uh, our second honorable mention, um, tied for third place, uh, is coming from our sports tech and human performance class, and that's Team Break It Down. Uh, congratulations, Team Break It Down. I can hear all the clapping in the audience. Um, I'm sure it's there. Okay, and then next, our number two um, team for the Spring 2020 Collider Cup uh, comes from our Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship Bootcamp, and that's Team C Warden. Congratulations to C Team C Warden. You can hear the applause, and it's very loud. Um, okay, and then finally, um, our number one team for this Spring 2020 um, Collider Cup is coming from our uh, Challenge Lab um, 185 Alternative Meat Course, and it's Team Prop Up. Congratulations, Team Prop Up. Uh, you win this beautiful Collider Cup here. Um, thanks for all your hard work. Um, and thanks again to all the teams. So congratulations. And I would just like to say, sorry, Keith, just real oh, quick. Um, so if Team Prop Up, if you guys are here, if you want to turn your videos on real quick and sort of kind of virtually accept your award, kind of, sort of. Hi. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So I have, I want to ask you guys just a few quick questions now that you guys are the winners for this semester's Collider Cup. Um, what did the Collider Cup 6 mean for you guys this semester? Um, this was obviously our dream. Um, I, it's something that we've both been really passionate for a really long time. Um, Ricardo is insanely amazing. Like you said, for him winning the, the award, he just pushes us and in such great ways to explore new things and gives us so much great insight and so we were just so incredibly happy even to participate so thank you guys so much thank you and so what does this mean for you moving forward um we we're already planning on moving forward either way i think hopefully this will help us receive funding so that we can actually push this into a real thing in a shorter period of time which is really exciting great so then so so that's kind of what it means for, for you and your company with that Cool. All righty. Well, thank you again and congratulations and congratulations to everyone and all teams and everyone who've been here today and for bearing with us as we try this whole new format. Um, hopefully we'll be back in person again in the fall. Um, so yes, in the spirit of innovation, thank you all again for being here. So thank you audience for participating. Um, that technically wraps up the Collider Cup 6. Um, like I said, we'll hope to be back again in person next, sem next semester. But if you'd like to stay around while all of our screens come on and we attempt a screenshot, feel free to do so. So thank you again. All right.